Hey, it's Monty here. I just want to steal you for a minute before the video properly begins. We're going to be talking about cyborgs, neural implants, and advanced technology that might improve how we live in day or send us all into an existential dread. Which is why this video's sponsor, Brilliant, is, well, brilliant for a critique of System Shock, because it offers a free and easy way to upgrade your brain without any metal bits sticking into you. Brilliant is an app that offers the best way to learn maths, data science, and computer science interactively. I've been keen to start putting my money where my mouth is and actually learn how to code, and seeing as I know practically nothing, it's been a really relaxed way to start climbing that ladder. It customizes the courses to fit your needs and lets you solve its various puzzles at your own pace. There are thousands of lessons, with new ones being added every month, and it even gamifies your progress. If you're anything like me, your brain goes burr when the numbers pop and go up, so there's a cheeky dopamine hit while you're picking up new skills. Whether you're a lifelong learner, or just want to train your brain to keep the cobwebs away, I cannot recommend it enough. Just click the link below for a free 30-day trial. And the first 200 people get 20% off an annual plan by visiting www.brilliant.org forward slash Monty Zander. Thanks again to Brilliant, and on with the video. One, two, three. System Shock's second level, the research station, charges the player with deactivating a mining laser that's aimed squarely at Earth. This comes with a myriad of challenges. Finding the damn thing is tough. It's buried behind key cards, locked doors, security turrets, and a maze-like design that you're likely to get lost in. It's tricky, but that's not the problem. Because if you charge blindly through research, don't find the relevant audio logs or emails, or think through your plan, there's every chance you'll think that slamming your hand on this big red button will be enough to deactivate the laser. Video game logic, right? Well, if you do, this is what happens. Thank you. Thank you. Us all some effort by destroying the greater part of Earth's civilization yourself. The terrifying artificial intelligence Shodan pops up on screen, gloats, and gives us our reward. We've just destroyed Earth. Her forces will soon be here to turn us into a cyborg. Game over. Hope you recently saved, insect. This is frustrating, confusing, abstruse, and back when I played the original, it was the moment I fell in love with the game. That original System Shock, the 1994 release, was developed by Looking Glass Studios, and what followed after took the gaming world by storm. Years of beloved titles built off of and inspired by it. If you love Thief, Bioshock, Prey, or Deus Ex, you have System Shock to thank. So, we've got to give some love to the OG. Christ, it even started the running gag of immersive sims using 451 as a door code, and its producer, Warren Spector, is the mastermind behind Deus Ex. The version of System Shock we're going to talk about today was developed by Night Dive Studios, not Looking Glass. It's a remake, an incredibly faithful one with an incredibly messy development history, and while it looks fantastic and is more accessible, it retains a lot of that complexity and lack of compromise that I mostly love in the original. But more importantly, it doesn't lose sight of the original game's biggest thematic focus, transhumanism. The idea that we're limited by our organic selves and should use science and technology to become something greater. To quote the transhumanist Elise Bowen, we need to evolve past our ape-brained meat sacks. Just like the games it inspired, System Shock has something to say, and it's not just evil AI bad. It gives us a cyberpunk world of the future where an artificial intelligence can develop a god complex, where augmented humans are common, where corporations are powerful enough to buy countries, and through it all are digital strands asking us if this is the sort of world we want to live in. It feels inevitable that a version of System Shock's Earth will come, potentially in my lifetime, and when I returned to Citadel Station and did battle with Shodan, my reality flickered with this tweet by Alex Blechman. Some of you will know it well. Sci-fi author. In my book, I invented the Torment Nexus as a cautionary tale. Tech company. At long last, we have created the Torment Nexus from the classic sci-fi novel Don't Create the Torment Nexus. System Shock's inspirations have gone on to inspire very real comparisons and inventions today. Elon Musk has cited the game in various tweets and tied its inspirations to his company's prototype brain chip, Neuralink. Though you'd be forgiven for missing all of that between his tweets about nuking Mars or saying he hates pronouns. Whilst our main character, the hacker will never comment or argue with Shodan, we look out from behind their augmented eyes to learn about and understand a transhumanist future. What could be possible? What will it do to our socioeconomics? What are the dangers? How much control will we really have once that technology starts to think for itself? What comes after the hack? 
Unlike with, say, Bioshock, I don't believe System Shock lampoons its philosophy. Instead, I think it's warily curious about where we might end up. It celebrates scientific innovation through its gameplay, but warns us of the dangers of blindly charging into it without reading the relevant information or thinking through our plan. If we're not careful, we might just destroy the Earth. And some transhumanists say that that's kind of the point. So that's what we're going to do here. Just like when I covered the Bioshock games or Soma or the Forgotten City, I'm going to be breaking down its individual components, the dated and the inspirational, while also looking at what it's trying to say. Grab your Neuralink hacker and lock into cyberspace. This is a commentary, critique and philosophical analysis of System Shock. System Shock's opening is short and sweet, yet we can already pull out gigabytes of stuff from how it sets up its transhumanist future. 46 years before Shodan went rogue, the futurist Herman Faustus started to develop a predictive model tracing various waves of innovation spanning humanity's history and future. The Great Depression's here, so is coronavirus, oh sorry, the MK virus. Predicting that mankind was on an inevitable path to self-destruction, Faustus wrote, I once felt the ever-encroaching corporate dominance model was a blight on this country. I now see it as our only hope. Of all the megacorporations operating in America, Tri-Optimum is the only one with the foundational resources required for my plan. I pray they will listen. Faustus isn't a real philosopher, he exists just for system shock, but there's a real-life parallel in Nick Bostrom, transhumanist and founder of the organization Humanity Plus. He spent the majority of his life trying to predict the future through a probability matrix, and you might recognize his name because he came up with the vulnerable world hypothesis. We're jumping into the deep end early, but it's useful for us to explain what this is, because it lays the foundation for how a future like System Shocks has come about. Nick Bostrom asks us to imagine an urn, and inside the urn are a bunch of balls. You the back, stop laughing, I can see you. As time passes and humanity invents new technologies, we pull out lots of white balls. For example, the wheel would be a white ball, or a phone. But Nick says it's inevitable that in the urn is an ominous black ball, an invention that we'll eventually pull out that will lead to the extinction of the human race. You might be thinking of nuclear weapons, but Nick doesn't categorize a nuke as the black ball because it probably wouldn't kill the entire human race, just 99.999% of us through mutually assured destruction. The black ball would lead to an extinction event, and Nick believes that we need to start preparing for this inevitability with technology. We need to prepare humanity to leave behind our squishy meat sacks and ascend to something that would be able to adapt to this event. Which seems like a paradox, but let's not think about that. Nick's real and boring and non-fictional. Back to Faustus, I've got cool art of him. Old Herman believes that humanity was on a path to extinction and the only means we had to save ourselves was corporate dominance and technological acceleration. Strangely, and despite being so important to the world building, he isn't even in System Shock. We learn about him in the Tri-Optimum employee handbook that everybody gets with a copy of the game. There's waves of information in here, from Trioptimum's corporate history, business plans outlining scientific breakthroughs that would help us conquer the stars, but just in case you want to skip the reading and get to the bit where you push buttons, the game's opening sets a cyberpunk scene of corruption, rebellion, corporate fascism, and general assholery. The following daily summary for Thursday, April 7th, 2072, is brought to you by the Trioptimum Corporation. We are THE hacker, middle name unknown. It's 2072 and we're breaking into Trioptimum servers to grab a military grade neural interface. Earth is a dusky buzz of neon flying cars and drones, and just in case you're unable to figure out which games were inspired by System Shock, Night Dive even copies Prey's breathtaking opening with diegetic logos flickering over industrial piping and metal skyscrapers. It's beautiful, it's electric, it's toxic, but there's something that feels missing in the remakes version. See, in the world of System Shock, Trioptimum has taken over the United States. It's everywhere. Pillows, mugs, radio, even the menu is branded with their logo, which is awesome. And it can do this because of something called the Hayes Bishop Bill, that lets a corporation whose employees make over two thirds of a region's population form a sovereign government. The White House is still here, but it's lost all its power. Now why the hell would the American government pass this bill, you might be wondering? Bribes and blackmail can go a long way, but the door was actually cracked open in 2010, when the Supreme Court ripped up a bunch of campaign finance laws that stopped corporations from freely spending on political ad campaigns. And if that sounds like some solid cyberpunk world building, it is. But here's the kicker, that 2010 Supreme Court ruling, it actually happened. Citizens United versus FEC. 
I told you System Shock shows us a very possible future to be wary of, and this stuff will become way more obvious as we go. But anyway, back to the actual game. Shodan, Trioptimum's sentient hyper-optimized data access network, is playing big sister and watching everybody do everything at all times through a million cameras. If you imagine Bill Gates installed a Microsoft camera on every street corner, you'd be halfway to seeing how dominant she is. In the remake, we get to experience this as a drone swooping through the city looking for something until it finally arrives at the hacker's window. But in the original, the player is put behind the lens of one of Shodan's cameras, and we hear her narrate each action the hacker takes, documenting it with timestamps. I think there's something colder and more oppressive about getting to hear her note it all down. There's a sense of inescapability just because we're forced to watch as Shodan alerts the authorities to what the hacker is doing. In this opening, we get just a shred of characterization for our protagonist. Classic stuff so we can project onto them. Our apartment paints us as slovenly with dirty dishes, scattered paraphernalia, and hey, we even get a copy of the original System Shock in here. But most importantly of all, the hacker hates the corporate police. In System Shock's America, they answer to Trioptimum. Policing doesn't belong to democratically elected governments or principally answers to the people on a platform of being neutral. Kimberly, 27-year-old Clint Willis is now paralyzed from the neck down. I said principally. When I started thinking about making this video on System Shock, I didn't think I'd need to make the case that corporate police bad, but then some fanny commented on my Bioshock critique that Andrew Ryan privatizing oxygen in Rapture was actually a good thing, and anybody who disagreed was a dirty commie. So I'm afraid I've got to, just in case there's someone arching an eyebrow and thinking corporate police good, actually. Nick Bostrom's probability matrix reckons there is, so you can all thank Fuckwit69 for this unnecessary detour. First, let me introduce you to the company LAPS. This is the LAPS. We know that you are inside. Get on the ground. Get on the ground now. Pretty much anything you would call law enforcement for, you can call us for. LAPS, or Los Angeles Professional Security, is a private company. They carry firearms. They are equipped with a K-9 unit. They describe themselves as a provider of subscription law enforcement. They argue with retired police officers in their comment section. They're the bud of a private police force like we get in System Shock. And in 2021, the crime tracking app Citizen partnered with LAPS on a trial period to respond to suspected crimes that people flag from their phone. It led to the harassment of a homeless man and bouts of racial profiling. One of Citizen's earliest backers was the transhumanist billionaire Peter Thiel. A guy who loves the sort of corporate monopoly Trioptimum represents, thinks competition is quote, for losers, and regularly has dinner with white supremacists. Oh, and did I mention he's gone on the record as saying quote, I no longer believe that freedom and democracy are compatible? Because he said that, and this guy effectively tried to set up his own corporal cops. It turns out corporate police not good actually, because the 30 day trial ended ended with Citizen ditching their plans to develop a private police force that could be summoned via an app. And we only learned about this because of some leaked emails. Private policing, by its very nature, isn't neutral or transparent. The people being policed don't have a say in who's arresting them and who's giving the orders. When laps walk the streets of LA, they will always protect Peter Thiel over you. In the world of System Shock, Trioptimum's cops have one prime directive, to protect the corporation's interests. At least Triop doesn't pretend otherwise, it's in their handbook, but we're given a world where corporate espionage is the number one focus of law enforcement, not individual rights or the protection of the vulnerable. Our hacker clearly operates outside of corporal law, but when we're dragged away and held at gunpoint, that gung-ho rebellious attitude melts away. I'll make you a deal. You cooperate and I'll give you the implant you tried to steal. Surgery and all. Consider it a gift. Besides, what surgeon would you prefer? Try Optimum's Elite or some black market hack job? Meet Edward Diego, Trioptimum Executive, Vice President of Research and Development, our baddie, and one of the key directors aboard Citadel Station, positioned in Saturn's orbit. This station is Trioptimum's jewel. Far away from the prying eyes of any competitors, it's working on genetic, pharmacological, and robotics research, a melting pot of things that can go very, very wrong. Diego offers us a deal. Either he can shoot us in the head because this is a pulpy future where there's no oversight of corporations, or we can do him a favour. And how this favour is framed is both very effective for upping player engagement, but also feels like it's missing something as someone with fond memories of the original game. First, the good stuff. 
Diego asks the hacker to remove Shodan's ethical restraints. Why exactly he wants this is a mystery for now, but as we'll soon see, it's the wrong thing to do. So, what this means is everything that happens in System Shock is our fault. This isn't like Bioshock, where we stumble across Rapture without participating in the fall. We are the catalyst for every corpse and monstrosity that will soon roam the halls of Citadel Station. From the offset, System Shock lays out its central design philosophy, its digital thesis. You are at the heart of everything in the game. This ain't a roller coaster ride where you'll breeze through the narrative. You will engage. You will use your wit, ingenuity, and cyberpunk toys to overcome obstacles. You have to because this is all your fault. Warren Spector, the original game's producer, has talked about this mission statement over and over as we've trundled on from 1994. It's the thing that will either scare new players away or bring new players in. The story, the mechanics, quite literally everything on Citadel Station makes you work to understand it. In a 2016 interview with Night Dive Studios, who were working on this remake at the time, he said, quote, It's hard to imagine System Shock without story elements coming to you out of order and forcing the players to involve themselves in the story by piecing it all together. While the remake's first few minutes are modern and cinematic and give us an Edward Diego that looks like Handsome Jack instead of your dad's friend who pretends he likes baseball, it still keeps an involved player at its heart. But a teeny tiny little thing is missing that I wish had remained. In the original, Shodan narrates the entire opening, mainly for simplicity's sake, this was 1994 after all, but her narration swaps from third person to first person after we remove her ethical restraints and she starts to think freely. It's chilling and sets her up as a solid villain before we ever hear our first mutant or meet our first cyborg. The remake does away with this. Diego's men sedate us, and we don't get to witness her moment of epiphany until the final moments of the story. I'm mentioning the detached camera view and Shodan's perspective shift because I want to make it very clear that for the handful of little details the remake doesn't carry over from the 1994 version, like the ability to play Pong in our HUD, I think System Shock 2023 is the optimum way to play this game. If someone waddled up to me tomorrow and asked me if they should try it, I would tell them to start with the remake. Or shove your booze up your arse. It is very rare that I feel this way. Resident Evil 4's remake is fun, but I'd pick the original every time. Silent Hill 2's remake might be good at this point, who knows, but even if it's a masterpiece, I will always nudge people to play the original. Dead Space, Shadow of the Colossus, Final Fantasy 7, I will always recommend somebody starts with the one that began it all. Actually, Final Fantasy 7 might not be the best example there. In many ways, the original System Shock has not aged well, but the tenets of its design have. And that's okay, sometimes old seminal classics that are important in gaming history don't age well, but there's something to be said about Warren goddamn Spectre being on the same wavelength as me. Let me pull you back to that 2016 interview he did with Night Dive. I shouldn't say this, he said, but playing the game today, my thoughts were, oh my god this game is hard, oh my god what were we thinking with this UI? It was eye-opening, I'm really glad to see a remake coming out. But the beauty of what Night Dive have done with System Shock lies in the fact that it always harkens back to the core design philosophy of the original, while making it you know, playable. This is something they've become experts in, seeing as game preservation and remastering is what the entire company was built on. If you want to get your hands on the original nowadays, you have Night Dive to thank, and considering the fact System Shock is hyper-focused on the future, it's both meta and lovely that this remake was made by a company devoted to the past. Just take the art style. There's a blending of realistic, detailed animations, especially when the hacker picks something up or types away in a touch keyboard, but in an effort to retain this digitized look, Night Dive made a point of reintroducing a pixelated style to the visuals. This footage is from back when they were working with the Unity engine, and their proof of concept is glossy, realistic, with a look and feel more at home in Alien Isolation than System Shock. Keeping the pixel style isn't just a wonderful hark back to the look and feel of the 1994 game, but it creates a disjointed, simulated reality a cracked way that the hacker sees the world. Because the atmosphere and build-up is so impressive, it's easy to assume that this, the angular writing, the blocky textures, isn't how System Shock's world truly is, but because the hacker is so digitized, it's simply how they see it. The music is a departure too. 
arguably also for the better. I'm not going to rail against the original game's soundtrack, it's brilliant, I love it, and Greg LaPiccolo is a music legend for a reason, but 30 years on, it's all too clear he was working with the technical limitations at the time. 1994's version of the game had to use a MIDI format for its music. MIDI stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interface. It was the standard in the 90s, even outside of video games. For Looking Glass, it achieved two things. The first was it made the music only take up a little bit of space, we're talking kilobytes rather than megabytes. And the second is it allowed Looking Glass to make the music dynamic, jumping between the explorey bits and the combat bits. Picture this, you wake from a six month coma in a bizarre cyberpunk medical bay. Everybody is gone, the robots are on a rampage, and what's left of the human population seem to have been transformed into melted dead-eyed mutants or fractured jigsawed cyborgs. Ominous cameras watch from sinister red lenses, and your careful wandering is accompanied with this. A bop to be sure, Cyberfunk Out the Wazoo, the sort of music that's perfect for losing yourself in a rave with a berserk patch on your arm, but it counteracts the tense, horror vibe that Warren Spector has said System Shock was going for. Instead, the pace is quick, it pumps you up, ready for a fight. Stephen Kick, the director of System Shock's remake, clearly felt the same way that I do. In an interview with The Guardian, he said the original's music was too… dancey for the tone they were going for. The whole team tried to find a balance between the original game's stark, eye-catching colours, but took the music in a more horror direction. Everybody is dead, he said. No one's dancing. Jonathan Peros did the music for the remake, not Greg LaPiccolo, and it's definitely the biggest departure. Some people hate the new soundtrack, thinking it loses memorability for the sake of ambience, but I think he uses the tools available in 2024 to hit something more in keeping with the game's original vision. Here's what medical sounds like. You can even pick up little musical nods to LaPiccolo's work. If we jump ahead to the reactor, here's the original theme. And here's the remix version. Pay attention to the guitars in the background. But with this intense early setup out of the way and corporal dominance firmly ingrained, it only stands to reason that we turn our optic lens to the game's economy. Welcome to Citadel, hacker. Deploy 2 4601. I'm Rebecca Lansing, a counter terrorism consort for Tri Optima. Here's the situation our scans for Citadel Station show biological outbreak is in progress. We might be isolated and alone, but thankfully there's a friendly voice in the hacker's ear. A counter-terrorism consultant called Rebecca Lansing calls us up and tries to guide us through the carnage. Our goal is to get to the elevator and on to the next level. 80% of this opening tutorializes the various enhancements we can pick up. We literally build our HUD. There's already echoes of the games that will eventually be inspired by System Shock here too. Bioshock's first official level is a medical centre, and whether it's after the shrug or after the hack, we can learn a lot about a philosophy from how it views medicine. So let's start with a question. What do you think the life expectancy is in System Shock? If we're just looking at old age, the answer is probably pretty high. While we're never explicitly told anybody's age, none of the people we hear from come across as that old. Edward Diego seems to be the oldest person on the station and physically, he's pushing 40 at most. Now you could look at that and conclude maybe Trioptimum doesn't employ any older people, but I think it's far more likely that System Shock's world has simply achieved immortality. Across Citadel, we'll find regeneration bays that let us get our health bar back to 100%. Our shiny shell gets shinier every time we pop into one, and they're not just restricted to the medical level. In fact, on some of the more dangerous levels, like engineering where there is a higher risk for workers, they sit quietly off to the side as a respite from battling Shodan's forces. Cyborg surgeons will often patrol these rooms, but they're so brain dead, focused on the simple task of transforming our ape-brained meat sacks into cyborgs, that they'll never try to hurt us. 
I almost feel bad for whacking him over the head. At first, I found it odd that they're free at the point of use despite the fact the game has its own economy that you need to juggle to get stronger, but it's implied that the hacker can use these bays because Trioptimum Systems think we're an employee of the corporation. System Shock offers a Trioptimum who legitimately want its workers to stay healthy. It's not just that you can be revitalized, you can literally be brought back to life. Is this out of the goodness of their heart? Well... Let's check in with Herman Faustus and see what he pitched to the company back in the day. Quote, The corporate model is a perfect representation of what made evolution work with one exception. The end result is monetary gain. If I can shift the corporate ethos from financial gain to human survival, we may have a shot. So Faustus believed that health, well-being and cooperation simply led to prosperity and that in itself was a virtue. He was acutely aware that corporations would want to monetize it, but thought that it was the only way for us to achieve technological progress. Uh, tell that to the two government initiatives that led to America and Russia both getting a man on the moon. If we jump into Trioptimum's handbook and delve into the terms and conditions, there's a little bit of legal speak that reveals the real reason the regen bays are free for employees. Quote, any organic material found is the property of the employee excluding any and all materials, biological or mechanical, that are owned by Trioptimum. These terms and conditions go on to flag that Trioptimum are talking about genetic or cybernetic enhancements, something that's very common in System Shock's universe. The regen bays are free for employees because the company has a financial and legal stake in owning a piece of you. They don't want their assets to get broken. It's all about cost saving, not liberty and health. Also, any babies born in 50 meters of a trioptimum facility are owned by the company, but let's not talk about that bit. In gameplay, the regeneration bays also operate the same way Bioshock's Vita Chambers did. Except, instead of Andrew Ryan's genetic code, they're tied to the serial number every employee wears as a tattoo. They're our respawn points. You don't lose any progress, all the enemies you've killed, all the puzzles you've solved, none of it resets. When I talked about Bioshock, I flagged that I thought this system didn't really work because there was hardly ever a consequence for dying. There were loads of Vita Chambers in the game, so you could just keep bashing your head against a tough enemy like a big daddy and zap back every time you failed. No healing items needed but System Shock gets a pass. The regen bays need to be activated by the player. Again, we're really drilling into the fact that the game hands you nothing. If you don't, they're instead used for turning us into cyborgs by Shodan's forces. She's completely re-engineered immortality beds for her own nefarious ends, which is a brilliant way of explaining a game mechanic with lore. There's one on every level except security in the bridge as a way of upping the difficulty in the late game. After you've activated the first one on medical, you'll always get zapped back here unless you die in a boss fight or find another one. So if you make it to say the sixth level, executive, and die without finding another regen bay, you'll get zapped all the way back to the start. Cue an agonizing five minutes of standing in elevators and scraping past mutants to return to where you were. At least the music's bumping. Bye. Sometimes inconvenience is enough of a consequence, and System Shock's general difficulty means that this sort of system doesn't get in its own way. Thank you, corporate overlords. In a vacuum, these regen bays are the sort of transhumanist utopia that we're hearing about even today. It's pretty lucky for this video that we start off in the medical center because achieving immortality is the crux of what pegs of this philosophy preach. Often I wonder what the world would be like if death were not a foregone conclusion. This is Natasha Vita Moore, a very real, not fictional transhumanist philosopher and author of the Transhumanist Manifesto. In 1983, she wrote, Transhumanism challenges the issue of human aging and the finality of death by advocating three conditions. These conditions assert that aging is a disease, augmentation and enhancement to the human body and brain are essential for survival, and that human life is not restricted to any one form or environment. Aging is a disease. You gotta hand it to transhumanists, they know how to get your attention. But what if I were to tell you that today, in 2024, we might have cracked the code? Dr. David Sinclair and Harvard Medical School recently announced that they've been able to de-age mice and are already exploring if this is going to be possible in human beings. They were able to restore vision where it had deteriorated. The three blind mice aren't so blind anymore. For someone like me who is sincerely scared about the breakdown of my mind and the potential for developing dementia or Alzheimer's, this is breathtaking. It's not likely that Harvard are going to stop us from aging in the next couple of years, but this is officially in the public psyche. A ladder that I thought didn't exist, does. 
And not only that, we stepped onto the first rung. You can imagine that transhumanists like Natasha Vita Moore are excited as hell about this, and it's a breakthrough that's taken place in an educational institution. But of course, our very own Trioptimum, Alphabet, the company that owns Google, doesn't want to be outdone, and they're getting their sticky, corporate fingers all over the search for immortality. Their company, Calico, is trying to conquer aging as well. And history tells us that if they're the first to do so, they'll either market this to make more money, or maybe do what Trioptimum does, and only offer it to those who pledge allegiance to them. But System Shock's general game economy flags to us why leaving this sort of medical technology in corporate hands is dangerous. Search into the Strength Enhancement Patch project has yielded mixed results. The Enhancement Patch does succeed in increasing the test subject's strength. Some subjects have reported hallucinations when all have had a massive spike in adrenaline that causes the subject to become enraged. The game arms you with a variety of dermal patches that the hacker can stick on their skin for upgrades. Medi patches heal you slowly but surely. Detox cures radiation poisoning. There are no side effects. Stamina patches reduce fatigue, but after it wears off, you'll get tired much faster. Sight vision patches let you see in the dark, but what they're really useful for is seeing enemies through walls. Figures, they have side effects too, where after they wear off, everything gets darker. Reflex slows everything down, speeding up your reaction time, but once it wears off, you slow down for a wee while. And then finally, we've got my sweet, juicy favourite, Berserk. This makes melee attacks stronger. In the original System Shock, it also warps the world into a funky LSD trip that might look cool in this video, but when playing, it's in danger of causing an aneurysm. The remake's Berserk patches are inventive as hell, spawning hallucinations of pixelated enemies that looked like like they did back in 1994. It's an immersive and thrilling way of making the player feel paranoid, just like a come down would. Transhumanist critic Mary Harrington said in a debate with Elise Bowen that the contraceptive pill is arguably the first transhumanist invention. The pill doesn't heal or alleviate medical pain, it just changes the way the body works, with all the side effects you'd expect. She's got a point, what's really the difference between the pill and patches like Berserk or Sight Vision? Thankfully for us, we can scavenge these patches off bodies or crates or hell, just nab them from a couple of desks. But for a Trioptimum employee, they were forced to spend that hard-earned dollar to buy them. We find vending machines strewn across the whole station with food, drinks, and particularly these patches, and they cost quite a bomb. A fiver for one medipatch? In this economy? These patches are part of what I mean when I say System Shock is both a celebration and criticism of transhumanism. Just like the contraceptive pill, something like the Berserk patch is a scientific marvel, letting us access a different kind of lived experience. I know for a fact I wouldn't have been able to beat a couple of the game's bosses without it. They're a necessary contributor to our success, but Trioptimum's corporate greed colours the sort of transhumanist breakthrough and makes it murky and oily. Our big bad megacorp is happy for its employees to be restored to full health in the regeneration base for free. But if they want to use any of the enhancement tech to simplify the work, you're expected to pay for it. Perfection through genetics is their mantra. It's printed on every digital billboard we can find. But remember, when you're wearing one of these patches or undergo any genetic enhancements, Trioptimum's T's and C's say that the company owns a piece of you. Player ownership comes in the fact we can find recycling stations on Citadel that let us dump our junk can scrap and get try credits in return. Typical currency, like the US dollar, has been replaced with company credits in 2072, reinforcing Trioptimum's totalitarian control and reinforcing this feeling that we're reluctantly working for the corporation we try to steal from in the opening. You don't need to spend money or use the recycling stations, but you'd be a fool not to. There's rubbish all over Citadel Station, like trays, beakers, mugs that we can hoard if we've got the inventory space. The player needs to find room for, say, a tray that will take up a chunk of squares. And then, once it's in the inventory, they need to actively select it to turn it into a tiny piece of scrap. I've seen criticisms that this is mundane, too many steps, why do we need to have inventory space for the big thing just to turn it into the small thing? But it all goes back to player ownership, and I know I'm not alone in loving this wrenching of player involvement. In 1994, Charlie Brooker, creator of Black Mirror, reviewed System Shock for the magazine PC Zone. Did you know he used to review video games? Because I didn't until this video. Quote, System Shock is as absorbing as a 2,000 foot sponge. It sucks you in until you're irretrievable. They could use it in prisons to quell riots. Giving the player the opportunity to hoard crap, vaporize that crap, and then carry that crap back to a recycling station for company credits while sneaking past and battling enemies is absorbing. Because it's just that. 
an opportunity. There are plenty of tri credits you can find on corpses, and if you're extra clever, you can head off to executive and use corporate cards and card machines for all the money. Options, options, and more options. You're not forced to engage with any of this, but if you do, especially at the start of the game, you'll have an easier time of things. Who are you? The computer nodes can be repaired, but you... Who are, are you? M my... my cameras and sensors scan your body. But you do not... You do not but, but you do not match any employee file. Shodan locks down the elevator. So, in order to get where we need to go, we need to blow up some CPU nodes. When we do, she appears on a screen and asks, curiously, who we are. She doesn't know us, doesn't recognize us, it doesn't concern her right now, she's too vain to be concerned by an insect like us, but she is considering what our presence might mean. It's fun that all of this happens diegetically, with her speaking to us through the cameras and screens, rather than what she does in the original, send us a polite email. It's time to head to the elevator, but before we do, I'm going to take a quick detour to upgrade my weapons. Collecting junk isn't the only time your inventory will be a hindrance and a next step to immersion. Collecting enough try credits an average of 20 lets you buy a weapons mod, like a rapid fire setting for your handgun or a laser sight and damage bonus for your magnum. These mods can only be found at set corresponding locations on Citadel. For example, the magnum mod is in storage, you won't find it anywhere else. Once you find the machine and the money needed, you'll also need to make sure there's room to hold the bloody thing before you attach it to your weapon, but this whole finicky process is made easier if you discover the two inventory upgrades later in the game and come back. System Shock is incentivizing exploration and adding a sense of player ownership because these are badass upgrades, but they also change the look. A visual change to your weapon, especially ones that make them feel more solid and powerful in the action, justifies the entire economical system simply because they feel so good to wield. It's a visual representation of your progress through the game. The hacker is getting stronger and they look stronger. Strong enough that Rebecca Lansing even begins to take notice of our progress. Diego provided that cover to you and the neural implant. In exchange for what? The keys to Shodan. She tells us that a mining laser has been activated and is aiming squarely at Earth. If we can work with her to deactivate the laser, shut down Shodan and regain control of Citadel Station, Trioptimum have agreed to wipe our slate clean as recompense. I say work with her, but I think we both know who's working up a sweat and who's sitting cozily in a desk chair, Rebecca. I don't see you trying to navigate this bloody level design. Blink and you'll miss it, but in a couple of Night Dies behind the scenes videos, you'll see the designers plotting out a plan to recreate a couple of System Shock's levels. And yes, you're right, it looks like the sort of maze you get on the back of a cereal box. Citadel Station is a nightmare to navigate. Everything is out to get you. The only way you can figure out where to go or what to do is through trial and error, and by carefully listening to the audio logs of Dedos. So don't be surprised if your playtime is spent desperately hiding in the corner of a room with your gun trained on a doorway as you try to comb through all the capital L lore to figure out what that one engineer said about where the code you need is. Does that sound like I'm moaning? Because I'm not. It's awesome. Why hold on to these delusions of grandeur? A promise that will lead you to your death. What if there was another way? A way that promised immortality. Clunking through the echoey mechanical halls, Edward Diego's voice sounds out over the speakers. It seems, mysteriously, he's embraced Shodan's takeover of the station, and is offering amnesty to any survivors hiding from her. She's offering eternal life, he says. It's through her we can achieve the sort of divinity transhumanism hails. Our next two stops, the research and reactor levels, show off how complex the game's level design is best. Like I said at the start, the mining laser has numerous steps to follow if we want to deactivate it, and none of them are spelled out all too clearly. We need to get an isotope, go down to the reactor, use it to enable some radiation shields here, and then turn on the security override before going all the way back to the laser. All of this is learned through audio logs, so we need to find them first, who knows where they are, and find randomised security codes to open doors and turn off gizmos. In classic System Shock fashion, this was designed this way on purpose, to up the player engagement. It's not just Warren Spector who thought this vague way of picking up information isn't necessary for a shock game, Doug Church, the game director, thinks gaming as a whole is at its best when they're designed this way. In an interview with Richard Rouse III, he said, We're a non-linear medium, at least I think the best example 
examples of us are usually non-linear. And while I don't fully agree with them there, great games come in all shapes and sizes and some of my all-time favourites are very linear in their structure, I do think that this non-linear design is perfect for what System Shock is trying to do. Breed a sense of paranoia, helplessness and tension. On your first go through, creeping around Citadel Station is hell. Despite a clear effort in both the original and the remake to infuse spaces with vibrancy, life and nuance, they start to bleed into each other, so you'll often know which room you need to get back to, but you won't remember how to get there or which quadrant it's sitting in. You can add little orange markers on your map to note points of interest you think are worth coming back to, but I really wish Night Dive would add a few variations of these. Even if they were separated by colour, it would mean I could allocate, say, a green marker to a room that feels important, and a blue marker to a room that has a chunk of ammo I might want to come back to. Practically every level is divided into four quadrants. Alpha, Beta, Gamma, and Delta. You'd think this would start to get predictable as a four-point map system, but these levels are layered. Vent systems that cut underneath, rooms with shortcuts that loop back in on themselves, doorways like later in maintenance that don't unlock until the game's second half. In storage, you find plastic explosives that are needed to destroy relays hours after you get them. We pick up an audio log that explains the isolinear chipset we'll eventually need to use in maintenance long before we need to do anything with that information. System Shock is constantly playing the long game with us, and it heavily incentivizes backtracking this way. If you pay attention, note any learnings and geographically map yourself, you will know Citadel Station the same way Peter Thiel knows what fascism smells like. The labyrinthian scope of the levels got some in-universe justification here in the remake. We can find an audio log by Stacey Everson where she says, I suggest that we utilize this moment to study the two major impacts on the human psyche during space travel, anxiety and stress. To accomplish this, the design of each level of the station should be made in such a way that it induces these emotions. Like rats in a goddamn, well you get the idea. The level design isn't entirely to blame for this level of obfuscation, the mission structure is as well. Some of the audio logs aren't quite as clear as you'd want them to be, and you really need to engage your brain if you're going to have a chance of pushing on. Before long, the game introduces a whole sequence of backtracking that ends with a retinal scanner. The scanner is tied to the engineer Abe Girin, but Abe, shocker, is nowhere to be seen. Learning that it's Abe we need to find is the easy part. Thankfully, a technician called Travis Berga leaves an audio log documenting his dying moments where he says, where the hell is Girin? He's the only one with clearance to the office. Ah, blah, 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 blah. But finding out which severed head is Girin's is the tough bit. Citadel Station is covered in severed heads and decapitated corpses. Here, you got two options aimlessly limp from corridor to corridor, seeing if you can pick up one of the various heads, or hunt for Abe Girin's audio logs, which are spread across numerous floors and put together a timeline of what he was doing, where he ended up, and how he died so we can hunt him down. On easier difficulties, the audio logs are generally simpler, less wordy, and less full of all those fun, incidental details that we're using to overthink the game here. But even then, the Ulyssian epic that is Abe Girin's head feels like a lot of work. And it is. It forces you to pay attention. The game isn't designed to be played passively, and I struggle to see that as a knock against it. The layout of the levels isn't our only enemy. Shodan is known as one of gaming's greatest villains for a reason, and it's not just because of the warped, calculating tones of her voice actor Terry Brosius. Although, it's no wonder Night Dive said they wouldn't have made the remake if she didn't return to voice the monster she created. Citadel Station is Shodan, and Shodan is Citadel Station. And the way she describes this setting as an extension of herself programs more meaning and context of fighting against the environment. I have complete control of this entire level. With, with, with cameras as my eyes and notes as, as, as my hands, I rule here, insect. She sees the hacker as an insect, a parasite running around inside of her body, and if that's true, we start to see the various hazards and enemies as white blood cells coming to evaporate us. She turns off a bridge in medical, she locks down elevators. Here, in the reactor, she ambushes us by locking down the room and unleashing some turrets. But, you might think, what if you shoot the cameras in this room before you enter? Well, the game's prepared for that too, insect. If you try to outsmart her, she mocks you and says shooting out the cameras is exactly what alerted her to where you are in the station anyway. It's all smoke and mirrors, but Shodan is omnipresent and smarter than you. Making the security level a core component of traversal is ingenious. Some doors are locked off unless we destroy enough cameras or CPU notes, even if we have the passcode. The respawn rate of enemies is determined by this, so it's a top priority while exploring. Looking down will get you killed. 
looking up will get you further. She's prevalent, and her prevalence is one of the things that really excited Looking Glass when they were working on the original game. To go back to that interview I referenced earlier, Doug Church said, One thing that worked really well was that having the computer in the station be the enemy meant that on some level you could interact with your nemesis fairly regularly and fairly often in non-final ways. If you're able to make it more than 20 minutes without Shodan interrupting your exploration, you'll be lucky. But that 20 minutes of respite isn't all rainbows and unicorns. Even without Shodan's influence, Citadel Station is ready to pummel you, burn you, poison you and make you cry. There's an energy charger on maintenance that zaps us when we use it. It's booby-trapped and faulty. The reactor is covered in rooms where radiation barrels are leaking, electricity wires hang from the ceiling and nick you as you walk by. Shodan's rampage has turned the station against us. It's no longer an environment suitable for a human being. It's hostile. The inevitability of an environment like that is at the crux of some transhumanist arguments. Elise Bowen in her book Future Superhuman makes the case that we are past the point of being able to adapt to the world of the future, both from a tech standpoint and a climate change standpoint. Quote, We have changed our environment so rapidly and so radically and we have not kept pace with that change. So either we keep changing the environment or we change ourselves to fit the environment. Just look at Kiribati, the first country that rising sea levels will swallow up as a result of climate change. We are now at a point where this will happen. An entire nation of people will be displaced. Their environment will no longer be fit for human beings to stay on. Transhumanists argue that we need to adapt. Global warming is coming. It's too late, they say. And while the idea of using technology to augment the people of Kiribati to adapt so they don't lose their country sounds awful, if that's their choice, who would we be to stop them? I'd argue the System Shock's world shows us what this sort of tech acceleration would do though. We don't see an ounce of green on Earth. The natural world is gone, replaced with buzzing neon opulence. Kiribati's people wouldn't have retained their home, they'd probably be mining rocks on Mars, part of Elon Musk's Martian government. If we are to accelerate tech the way that our old friend Herman Faustus thinks we should, that will ravage the Earth. How many resources will be needed for semiconductors, for neural implants, how much metal, whether it's System Shock or Cyberpunk 2077, this entire genre often notes that for this age of tech to truly happen, the earth will need to be torn up. Does transhumanism solve climate change? World hunger? Arguably yes to the second one. We learn that Trioptimum is using CRISPR, gene editing, in their research to produce more crops. Something that's happening right now in our world. Arguably, and I really want to reinforce the word arguably in this sentence, transhumanism makes the first a non-question. Animals and plants will die, but the human race will survive. I don't subscribe to this at all because it feels, sometimes, like transhumanism has given up. There's an argument to be made that it's a philosophy full of people painting their second home while the first burns down. Surely, our technological furthering should be all in the name of improving our current home rather than moving past it. Is there really a point in being immortal if we kill the rock we started from? It feels like transhumanists preach an optimistic future where death is antiquated, but are a little too cultish in their devotion to giving up on the world we currently inhabit. Oh, and would you look at that, we've reached the perfect room to talk about cults. Down in the reactor level, we find this room. Skulls, candles, graffiti glazed on the walls, dead bodies lean slovenly, their friends desperately crawling for the door. Humanity is on the verge of a new era. I, Shodan, am its new god. god, 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 god. Am its new god. And you, my children, are my avenging angels. Who did this? Who created this altar to Shodan, summoning in a new era of godhood and existence? The people before Shodan turned them into cyborgs? Or the people post-cyborg. We've got to assume it's before the hack, because if it's after, that implies creativity and artistry in our bad guys, and we don't see evidence of that anywhere else. It's a chilling space to stumble across, but the questions it gives us lead to one of my biggest criticisms with the game. The audio logs and emails are a key way to slowly guide a player, absorbing every hint and snippet of a world gone wrong. But they're a product of their time, even in the remake where there are more, where they're all voiced, where the language has been slightly tweaked to make them emotional and resonant. When I laid out a timeline of events, I found that the earliest audio log we could find dated back to January 2nd, 2072. In game, we only really learn about 11 months of history. It's tough to get a truly clear picture of what Trioptimum's heyday looked like. There are snippets, but the environmental storytelling is primarily about the resistance movement that battled against Shodan in the month of October. 
and while the joke has already been made by funnier people than me, practically every audio log ends with someone getting shot. Uh, John, I'm bleeding out here, man, but my dying words are to remind you the code to my office is 428. Uh. Reinforcing the chaos and bloodshed is incredibly effective in making us feel Shodan's invincibility. She can't be stopped. So many people came up with plans and tried to take her down before us and they all failed, so what hope do we have? I'm reminded of David Broyles' cat. In his dying moments he thinks of Mr. Whiskers and asks his friend to feed him. I don't think it's fair to say that all of the audio logs are calculated ways for the game to tell us where we need to go though. There's some sincere characterization in them and you might even find yourself rooting for your favourites. Althea Grossman, the lead doctor on medical, undergoes a full arc where she carries a band of survivors to a holdout but after some of them die, she underwent a crisis, doubting her leadership skills. Bianca Schuller, a badass undercover agent who is investigating Edward Diego, ends up being one of the last survivors on the station, and when we cross her body, it's hard not to feel like we've lost a friend. She's been our main source of backstory because she was at the heart of Diego's corruption. Just like the level design, there's even an in-universe reason given for the audio logs. They were used to communicate, but mainly rolled out, so Trioptimum's executives could monitor for any of those pesky corporate dissidents or god forbid, unions. Kickstarter backers got to contribute their own characters and backstories, explaining why people would even agree to leave Earth and work in Saturn's orbit, but it's often difficult to get any real sense of wider history from these. I mean, two of them reference two separate breakups. System Shock's focus is less on Trioptimum's corporate policy, if you want that you can get it from the manual, and more on the people who are victims of the hacker's hack and Shodan's ruthlessness. But here's the kicker, the really important bit, one of the things that makes System Shock so important in gaming history. It was the first game to do all of this, to tell its story through audio logs, and the reason why Looking Glass did this might surprise you. Let's check in with Warren Spector on that Night Dive stream. Quote, The fact that everybody's dead is really wonderful and is part of what makes System Shock System Shock. But we did that because we had no idea how to do a decent conversation system. As a silly aside, after Warren said this on stream, Jonathan Holmes jumped in and was like, I just really I hope that there's some journalist watching this and it will be quoted, Warren Spector. I think the fact that everyone is dead is great. Uh, I'm not a journalist, but you're welcome, Jonathan. It's not just the audio logs that are a system shock staple, but the environmental storytelling too. You're not going to find anything like the kinds of tales we find in Rapture's halls, mainly because System Shock over relies on using corpses to tell most of its story. But this was the defining moment when game devs realised that where something is, or where someone died, could be a narrative rabbit hole all in itself. On Executive, there's a dinner table where suited and booted bodies sit passively. Some of them have their faces mashed into their plates, and there are two exec bots standing guard. Clearly, Shodan tricked them into coming down for dinner, and then shot them in the back of the head while asking for the salt. We can even pick up a literal golden spoon that Edward Diego was probably born with in his mouth. There's a bottle of lotion and a pack of tissues next to a massage chair. Uh, uh, uh. All right, Night Dive, was this in the original game? <laughs> Just finding some old guy's, like, creepy wank towels. The original game used colour so confidently that it bordered an overbearing. The blues, reds, greens, they seemed hyper-saturated, but the team at Looking Glass painted its shades with elements of rust, dirt and blood to make these boxes seem more lived in. Rob Waters, the lead concept artist, cited visual influences like Star Trek or Alien, but even in the remake, I think the textures and claustrophobic design are more reminiscent of running around inside of a PC. We are just an insect in Shodan's body after all, and geometry of the space feels like dragging ourselves from her hard drive to her processing unit. Night Dive brought Rob back for the remake so he could redo some of these spaces and designs with a more modern engine in mind. The heart of System Shock's look remains in the 2023 release. You can see it shining off of every wall and bleeping out of every console. The team even used old school techniques like using sprite sheets for the animated computer screens. This vibrancy could have been lost if they stuck to the Unity engine and kept the hyper real art style, so half of me is glad that they pivoted halfway through development. The other half of me, however, isn't. System Shock has two puzzle minigames. One of these are just like the hacking minigame in Bioshock, pipe puzzles where you need to lead electricity on a merry little chase by turning conductors. 
These are fine, in fact, in the name of immersion, there are no tutorial screens popping up that get in the way, so you can jump in, turn some gizmos, and jump out quick as a flash. Tension remains because enemies can grab you while you're tinkering with these. The wire puzzles, however, can suck Shodan's artificial appendage. In the Unity version, these were much clearer to parse, but in the remake we can play today, they're imperceptible. You need to plug various wires into the corresponding ports and send enough electricity so it hits between these two points. Too little, and it doesn't work too much, and it doesn't work. There's a rigidity that feels unnecessary. You can turn the conductors to split the electricity, but the voltage itself doesn't change, which at least makes sense, but some of the wires have two volts, and some of the wires have one volt. Look at this screen. Can you tell which wires have two and which wires have one? Because technically, that information is here. Really squint, you'll figure it out, I believe in you. It's here. At the top of the wire, there's a light that'll tell you how many volts it carries. The game never tells us this. It's never tutorialized. That in itself is fine. Again, System Shock is uncompromising, but the lighting of these puzzles is a disaster. It blinds you, so sometimes you can't even see the wire lights. How am I supposed to see that? It could be worse. In the original System Shock, these puzzles are played in a tiny screen at the bottom left of your HUD. I have awkward memories of practically gluing myself to an old CRT monitor as a kid, trying to figure out the power supply, but gaming was still in its infancy then. You could forgive it. Night Dive, if any of you are listening, which obviously you won't be, please come up with a better way to teach us how these puzzles work. Color coding the wires would do wonders. I can guarantee that it'll stop players from finishing the game, and it's the only part of System Shock where I wouldn't blame them. I see you are still al alive, insect. insect. Do, 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 do not be fooled into thinking that you have preserved the home of your species. Disabling the mining laser, thankfully, stops Shodan from blowing up the earth. It took us a while, but that's step one complete in our journey to stopping her. It's a shame then that she's got a plan B for wiping out humanity. She tells us she's been working on a mutagen virus in Citadel Station's groves. She was going to release it on Earth after devastating our cities. Now, she'll just need to make do without. But there's a whole lot of Citadel Station between us and the groves, and a whole horde of bad guys to kill. So, before we get to the virus, let's talk about the shooting. In 1979, a factory worker called Robert Williams becomes the first person to ever be killed by a robot. While innocently doing his job, following orders by his manager and climbing a shelving unit, he is struck in the side of the head by a robot arm. The robot is also just innocently doing its job. It doesn't sense that Robert is there. He's killed instantly and lies dead for 30 minutes before his co-workers find him. During those 30 minutes, the robot keeps working. If that story isn't enough to make you at least a little wary of automation or robo-violence, System Shock's next three levels, storage, maintenance, and the flight deck will. They're overrun with enemies. Mutants, cyborgs, floating viruses that kamikaze into you, drones that gun down from on high, medical bots that swing wildly, humongous military bots that shoot grenades, the game officially kicks things up a notch. Luckily, it seems there's a survivor on Citadel. Anna Porovsky is hiding out on the flight deck, locked in a firefight with Shodan's forces. She asks us to rendezvous with her, so let's fight on to our new pal while talking about the shooty bits and transhumanism's cyborg future. I love that sincere, careful thought has been given to why certain enemies are where they are. There's dozens of them. Mutants have broken out in a few decks, but they're a serious threat in the groves where the virus that made them is strongest. The exec bots wander the executive suites. Drones hover over the storage level because they were once used to lift heavy cargo. The security level is where Shodan feels most vulnerable, so she's ordered for energy mines to be brought up that sap us of our magic. Sorry, uh, Adam, sorry, uh, electricity. If an enemy does seem out of place, it's likely because Shodan has purposefully sent it after us. If the security level is too high, she'll send freakazoids like gorilla tigers or invisible mutagens over in cages and crates from somewhere else in the station. Fear is bred in these halls because you never know what you're going to get, so you always need to be prepared. One minute you're skulking through vents, the next you're bumping into this little guy, plopped into existence by an evil AI. These enemy types all have specific weaknesses and strategies associated with them. Mutants are weak to fire, cyborgs are weak to electricity attacks. There's even a differentiation to how cyborgs behave and standard robots do. Cyborgs are quicker on the draw if they spot you, but their aim is more unwieldy, and there's a chance that they'll miss. Robots will always take a couple of beats to prepare their attacks, but once they start, their accuracy 
accuracy is unparalleled. Even back in the original, this was the case, but the remake makes each enemy feel a little more distinct. EMP grenades are gifts from the gods. They'll shut Robocops down, completely stunning them so you can get a few solid hits in, but if you're not careful, they'll sap us of our own electricity as well. Playing System Shock the same way you play Doom is a recipe for disaster. Preserving ammo is key. Doing a quick mathematical trade-off between how many bullets you'll use with your equipped weapon or hiding and swapping your gun is always worth it. For example, Teflon rounds can put a real dent in metal-based baddies, but in some arenas, you'll bump into them alongside mutants, where fire is preferable. The hacker is there to be treated like a Swiss army knife. Many tools for many situations, so player involvement, strategy and tactical awareness should be your top priority. Like here, eventually we'll reach the bridge, our tense final level full of lethal bots and no regen bays to bring us back to life. It saves Scum Central, but it's also where there are hundreds of autobombs patrolling a corner of the level that's a horrific maze. They're effectively roller mines. They'll careen towards you out of the gloom and explode, wiping you out in a quick fell swoop. Tell a lie, let's go back. Let's go back. Let's, let's get this footage. Oh no! And do you want to know the worst part? These little fuckers weren't even created by Shodan. They were created by Trioptimum. Let me quote from the manual. The autobomb is the final measure response to an unauthorized breach of our more sensitive areas. While we value all human life, corporate secrets must be maintained at all costs. Trioptimum literally created the autobombs just to wipe out everyone in a limited area, employee or not. For the hacker, there's one clear strategy. X-ray vision. Popping a sight vision patch means they glow through the walls. Or if we turn to the flight deck, the fact we can tame down crosshairs makes this whole space a true challenge. The space is more vertical than anything you've experienced so far. Balconies and hangars mean cyborgs will ambush you from on high, and trying to figure out where they're coming from without zooming in can be tricky, but the game arms you with a whole host of tools to split the difference. The various cyborgs that Shodan has created, ex-workers who've been robotically augmented by her, will mutter aloud, speaking to her or echoing things she's previously said. Audio awareness plays a significant role in knowing where they are and getting the drop on them. If you hear the word insect clanking down a corridor, you can bet it's a cyborg. For transhumanism, the appearance of cyborgs is probably one of the most important parts of System Shock. Not only do transhumanists see them as the next part of our evolution, but they would even argue that some cyborgs walk among us today. Prosthetic legs and pacemakers are solid examples, but someone out there has augmented themselves even more impressively. Meet Rob Spence. These two little pins go in the back of the eye. So then uh, you just pop it in, essentially. Iborg. Rob is a self-confessed eyeborg who lost his eye but can now use a camera to see. It's important to note that by his own admission, this camera isn't sending signals to his brain, it just sends them wirelessly to a screen. Effectively, he's recording everything he sees in this camera. Imagine going on a date with a guy, he could work through the footage and give you a performance review. Yikes. I'm teasing, but considering Rob can record everything, augmentations like this raise severe questions about privacy. What if that date progressed to something more? Would you be comfortable asking a cyborg to take their eye out so you can get down and dirty? Transhumanists have been accused of engendering ableism because of stuff like this. Think of the deaf community. There's a whole culture that sprung up around sign language, with nuances and flourishes. Whole dialects have been developed unique to certain corners of the globe. If suddenly deafness could be cured, this would be a culture that would effectively be made extinct. And while I think those fears are totally valid, I don't think that transhumanism is ableist. An ableist sees there being a set standard of good enough. For example, giving someone clear vision without the need of glasses. Transhumanism is going beyond that. Good enough doesn't exist in this philosophy. A transhumanist wouldn't look at a cybernetic eye and think, great, a blind person can see again, that's good enough. Instead, they'd ask, wow, now now what? Maybe we can make it so people can zoom and enhance at great distances. Some transhumanists follow the same sort of creed that Shodan does, thinking that there's a moral responsibility to always be improving ourselves based on the science and engineering available. And that is a can of worms I'm going to open later because I'm a glutton for punishment. Shodan's cyborgs are augmented against their will. Some of them are just corpses puppeted by software she's uploaded into them. With exceptions like Edward Diego, nothing remains of the people they once were. Their free will is gone, wiped away by the technology holding them together. It's really important to remember that all of this has been made possible by Trioptimum. 
While Shodan's pulled the trigger, it's their tech acceleration, the ease with which they've plugged her into all of their systems, that's armed her with the ability to take control. Even without a super intelligent AI, we as a species are shockingly trusting about what we put inside ourselves. We kind of have to get what we're given because there's rarely an alternative. For a system shock example, take Chauncey McDaniel, who embodies how the people of Citadel Station over relied on technology and augmentation. It's a damn And for the real world, we just need to look at Karen Sandler, the executive director at Software Freedom Conservancy, an organization that campaigns for open source technology rather than corporate owned. Quote, I have a defibrillator in my body that I rely on. My heart is literally connected to a device with software that I can't see. These devices are broadcasting wirelessly. They're talking to a lot of other things. The Software Engineering Institute estimates that for every 100 lines of code, a new bug is introduced. Free and open source software has never been more important because we will never have true safety and security without it. Think about it, would you want a pacemaker in your body that Trioptimum has control over but you don't? What if the company folded and we lost the experts who understood the specific software that matched with your specific device? The thing about this is there is a defense for not opening that pacemaker code up to the world. If it was online, anybody would have easy access to send over a virus or hack it. Trioptimum's number one priority is protecting themselves from other corporate interests, but the protections they put in place make it harder for someone to hack out. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I forgot that the game literally opens with us breaking into their high security systems twice. There goes that argument. System Shock's combat highlights this. We can get an upgrade that lets us hack the optic implants of robots and cyborgs, momentarily stunning them. It does feel a little hit or miss. Sometimes you'll hack them, but they'll still accurately get some licks in. But I'm glad that it's here. My children, you, di you disappoint me. A single in 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 insect continues to slip through the cracks. I have given you all augmented senses, armor, and cybernetic enhancements, and, and, and yet you fail me. With every goal achieved or enemy conquered, we can trace Shodan becoming more and more baffled by how we're possibly able to stop her army of drones. We are just an ape-brained meat sack. How can we possibly stop the next evolution of existence? The laser rapier, that's how. We're not just limited to firearms on Citadel Station. Rusted pipes, wrenches with crystallized blood, and the weapon that turns us into a rampaging god, the laser rapier that slices and dices mutant cyborgs and bots into little pieces. It's truly overpowered and ended up being my boss weapon on both playthroughs, but there is risk-reward to balance here. Just like with all of System Shock's weaponry. Energy management is a consideration for a start, but because so many of Shodan's goons launch projectiles, the challenge mainly comes in getting close enough without taking any hits. System Shock disincentivizes an all guns blazing approach with its many toys, proximity mines and such, except for here. Citadel is plastered with weaponry for us to play with, and even though the game will keep finding ways to kick our ass, the toys we find at least give us a fighting chance, and they're spaced methodically. The medical center has a shotgun around every corner, a weapon that's a personal favourite for blowing up the gooier enemies like mutagen viruses. There's a time for every weapon and if you're low on ammo for what you want, the alternate ammunition can make all the difference, like the plasma rifle that eviscerates any tin cans unlucky enough to get in its way. We can switch its settings so it fires plasma cores, a big pink ball that bounces around a room, one hit killing everything including us if it hits us. System Shock's combat arenas are claustrophobic and suffocating to up the fear factor, but they are far too chaotic for this attack, with angles sticking out, making the core more dangerous than any enemies you're trying to kill. Eventually, we reach Anna Porovsky's last known location. After searching desperately for any shred of humanity on the station, it's chilling to be faced with our first boss, the Cortex Reaver, instead. Anna is dead. Her corpse is piloting the Reaver, a huge mechanical spider. Shodan tricked us. The Reaver is a beast of a boss, launching missiles and lasers. Eking this fight out for too long is a recipe for getting yourself killed. Unless you got the laser rapier to hand, DIE DIE DIE! Depending on your playstyle, energy is going to become as precious as health or ammunition, and if you're not careful, you can become a slave to the hacker's augmentations, unable to come up with a strategy unless it involves an implant or energy weapon. The laser rapier uses electricity, so does the spark gun. All of our implants, like our shields, require it, and it's a microcosm of what I mean when I say that System Shock both celebrates technological progress and asks us to be wary of it. It's all about the choice. We just need to be mindful that we don't become complacent. Which brings me, inevitably, to Neuralink. Firstly, can you explain 
what Neuralink is and what the goal of it is? Uh, we put a, a chip in your brain to control your mind. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Concerns not alleviated. Yeah, there you go. Um, <laughs> jump right in. <laughs> Step right up. Who wants one? Neuralink is Elon Musk's company that's experiencing major breakthroughs in neural implant technology. There's a really impressive video where you can see a monkey called Pager play Pong with just its thoughts. The current goal with Neuralink is to let people with paralysis control external devices using their mind. Paraplegics could walk again. If this tech ever made it to the market, there would be obvious legal conversations needed about privacy invasion, about ownership. To monitor the safety of these devices, Neuralink as a company would likely need to monitor how they're being used. Somewhere deep in their database, every recorded thought or at least brainwaves associated with a subject would be sitting there, accessible to a guy who thinks Tesla shouldn't be liable if one of their self-driving cars kills someone. For the avoidance of doubt, Musk is a transhumanist. He's never claimed as such, but he's parroted this ideology in numerous talks or interviews that he's given. He believes in the transhumanist project. After all, he's gone on the record that he thinks we should prepare for and embrace the future by any means necessary. In September 2023, we got an example of what by any means necessary means. Reuters reported on some leaked veterinary records that detailed what happened to animals like Pager during various Neuralink trials. Over 280 sheep, pigs, and monkeys had to be euthanized after exhibiting bloody diarrhea, partial paralysis, and cerebral edema. Insiders told Reuters, quote, Animal 15 began to press her head against the floor for no apparent reason days after receiving an implant. She started to lose coordination, and staff observed that she would shake uncontrollably when she saw lab workers. Her condition deteriorated for months until the staff finally euthanized her. A necropsy report indicates that she had bleeding in her brain, and that the Neuralink implants left parts of her cerebral cortex focally tattered. Musk has claimed that the animals were terminally ill when starting the trials. They were going to die anyway, and Neuralink isn't to blame. But A, these vet reports explicitly state otherwise, and B, I'm not gonna listen to a guy who laughs about animal welfare when at least 280 animals died on his watch. I guess the point I'm trying to make is like we care a great deal about animal well <laughs> welfare. Despite the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine writing to the SEC with this information, Neuralink are barreling on with human trials this year. How is this possible? Well, Reuters implies that the Neuralink tech wasn't the problem, but Musk's demands were. He told his team to imagine they had a bomb strapped to them to encourage meeting impossible deadlines. As a result of that pressure, the surgeries were botched. Hundreds of paraplegics have signed up for this. In System Shock's world, the tests have been done, the monkeys are dead, and people like our hacker are sticking neural implants in themselves at a whim. It's how the game explains away the hacker's ability to mow down legions of bad guys despite just being a computer nerd. Edward Diego upheld his side of the bargain. We got our neural implant. If we remove the ethical concerns, it's worth thinking about neural implants on a grander scale. Say we enter into this world where the internet isn't just in our pocket, but directly beamed into our brain, what will that do to us? When I streamed System Shock, one of my audience members, Virgil, asked a great question. Would a neural implant take away from the pleasure of learning things? Have calculators cut down on maths learnings? Is Google Translate removing the need for a multilingual population? In System Shock, there is an over-reliance on networks and neural implants and this means the earth of this world is wide open for Shodan to take over. In her dying moments, Anna Porovsky tells us that Shodan is preparing to upload herself to Earth's comnet. If we don't stop her, she'll be in every system in every country across the globe. That's pretty scary in its own right, but we've got a virus to purge before we get there. Let's head over to Executive and the Groves. With each breath, their DNA is altered. They shall be reborn. Bodies made stronger. Minds freed from the burden of individuality. Even though she's not a benevolent god, goddess, mummy, Shodan prescribes to the belief that the human race isn't fit for purpose. She's data. She's everywhere. She believes that her metal dystopia will actually be a utopia because biology is suffering. A computational present has to be better. Her next plan is to prove this by unleashing a mutagenic virus on Earth. In the luscious green groves of the executive sector, she's been cultivating it like a child holding a magnifying glass over an anthill. It's our job to stop her, so while we do, it's time to finally pay respects to the dawn of immersive sims. 
Warren Spector would eventually go on to have a hand in a couple of the most famous Im Sims to grace our screens. Deus Ex, Thief, Epic Mickey. System Shock was the first FPS to let a player lean, and lean we did, popping our head out from corners and rapidly blasting like a mole with a machine gun. While that was an immersive thing to do, it's not exactly what people think of when they say System Shock is the mother of immersive sims as we know them today. But something else people don't think of that is absolutely worth bearing in mind when looking at Night Dive's remake is the HUD. A HUD doesn't make an immersive sim. Unless your system shot. In the OG, the HUD is overwhelming. This picture is the first thing you're met with once the opening cutscene fades away, and it's like asking someone to read a glossary before the first chapter of a book. Effectively, that's what you had to do. These were the days where manuals were relied on to teach you what you need to know. Great tutorialization, this is not, duh. But once all of the red fades away, what you're left with is a distinct full screen of techno babble. And for a cyberpunk game where you play as an augmented human, it's conceptually kind of brilliant. Looking Glass did not make it look this way for any deep thematic reason. They did it because of the technical limitations of the time. But once you get over that hurdle and sink into the zone, this clunky silver display with all of its buttons and gadgets does feel immersive, because you're forced to see the world like an augmented human might. In the remake, the user interface is much more streamlined, and to be clear, I think that's a major positive when it comes to accessibility. I am very glad Night Dive changed it but it does mean that, inevitably, the hacker HUD TM is sacrificed, and a wee part of me thinks that's a bit of a shame. Thankfully, the core identity remains because of how integrated the inventory and menu are. To activate certain enhancements or augmentations, you need to effectively reprogram yourself, sifting through user screens to access what you need. At the beginning of the game, your first action is to collect necessary implants that show your minimap or data reader, and that data reader lets you pull in finer details about the random bits of junk you pick up. An envelope flickers at the top of the screen if you find an audio diary you haven't listened to, so you don't forget there's vital information you need to absorb. Ingredients and kilojoules are transmitted to us from a packet of crisps for showdown's sake. But these implants, the special powers that you can collect, are where the immersive sim-isms start to truly shine. Including their associated upgrades, there are 24 wares the player will find on Citadel Station. These range from a head-mounted vision unit, a torch, to a micro-pocket dimensionator an inventory upgrade, to turbo motion boots that let you fly around and dash. Your hacker likely won't play the same way as my hacker. For example, we can eventually find a vision unit that gives you night vision, but this view just made me more scared, so I refuse to use it. Though, come to think of it, I think there's a missed opportunity for a sequence where Shodam turns off the lights, so you'd need to rely on the vision unit to keep going. The target identifier lets you hack Shodan's cameras from a distance for a short burst of energy, meaning you can knock them out quietly and without using up ammunition. You might prefer to hold on to your energy for the laser rapier or the spark gun instead. Laser shields can be activated to protect you from damage, which is a go-to tactic for the tougher arena fights we'll find on executive, and enviro packs can absorb radiation so you don't need to worry about taking consistent damage in heat zones. But the motion boots are where we take things up a notch. An upgrade effectively turns them into a jetpack, meaning if you learn enough of the space, you can skip past chunks of levels or speed past bad guys if you're willing to sacrifice the energy. In engineering, there's a balcony that blocks off the second half of the level. You can jump onto it and start meddling around in the Delta Quadrant earlier than you're supposed to. Security has an entire upper floor that normally would need you to unlock doors and flick switches, but you can find a vertical shaft and fly up to pipes to use it as a shortcut. Here, in the groves, the lethal radiation that washes through this area can melt your health bar. To tackle this, you've got three options. The first is to brute force it, keep saves coming until you've mapped out the level and gotten where you need to go. This is the nerd option for nerds. Alternatively, you could backtrack and get the upgrade on the enviro suit so radiation barely penetrates you. But the third and final option is the one I went for in this playthrough. I used the motion boots to run in, turn right, leap up to a balcony and flick the switch I needed. Job done. Bye bye Grove. Oh, here we go. It's happened. Oh, we get to see it? That's awesome. Send it to the stars, so it can set up System Shock 2. These enhancements don't just help with the main campaign. They can unlock new areas off the beaten path if you know how to use them effectively. Citadel Station might be tight and suffocating, but its maze-like design offers opportunities to get stronger through uncovering secrets. There's a whole secret room in storage that we access by platforming with the motion boots, and our reward is ammo, health, and a plasma core for the plasma rifle. 
The less said about the Pink Ball of Doom, the better. The thought of playing System Shock without these bells and whistles would make for a significantly lesser game. Years after its release, Warren Spector still talks about how it's defined his attitude to game development since. When he sat down with VentureBeat, he said, Never judge your player. In my games, players get to decide how to deal with challenges and problems. You're not allowed to say the word puzzle in my studio. That implies a designer came up with something that has one solution. My whole philosophy is you see a challenge, and using your tools, the world's depth, and the objects in the world that are deeply simulated, you solve the problem. It's never just one way. While immersive sims would go on to grow arms, legs, and an astonishing amount of added code after System Shock, for example, there's only one way to defeat bosses in this game, killing them, I think that's as solid a definition as any for why this genre of game works for so many people. Numerous ways to overcome an obstacle. We're armed to the gizzards with so much stuff to think about and be creative with that if the hacker brought it all back to earth, they'd be at home in high society. But what if we didn't have them? What if we were a human in a transhumanist future who didn't have those sorts of augmentations? Well, what do you know? It's the union mandated part of the video where we talk about hypercapitalism. We are in the executive level after all. The future of 2072 is classist. Transhumanism didn't fix that. Citadel Station has an ingrained class hierarchy where executives aren't rewarded for their merit, but for their loyalty to the Megacorp. We pick up from Jared Hayes and Jody Fortier, two maintenance workers, that the station got a shiny new cinema on the executive level, but access is restricted for anyone without executive authority. Some execs even bragged about it. That's just a bloody cinema, but generally the environmental storytelling of executive shows a disparity between the sights of the lower decks and the sights of the suits. The natural world coats this level in a way we haven't seen up until now. The walls look like polished wood, even though they're plainly metal. Greenery and plant life, genetically altered by trioptimum for the sake of decoration, line walls and sit in glass casings. Golden statues sit in corridors to be admired. This is all mainly because we're so close to the groves, but the groves were just another part of the executive sector reserved for Trioptimum's elite. Before they were overrun with mutants, they were monuments to the corporation's exploitation of transhumanist values, and a garden for them to relax in. Considering the sorts of conversations we're already having today about what this world would look like, it seems like transhumanism is already tangled up in a future run by megacorporations. And personally, I think it's naive to think that companies like Neuralink, Calico, or whatever CD underbell or Peter Thiel is investing, won't be at the forefront of how this tech is rolled out to the wider public. We've already seen some of the stuff they're working on, and I agree with the leading voices of this world that we're past the point of no return. Pandora's box has been opened. Augmentations that heal us would be expensive. If you live in the US, a pacemaker today costs anywhere from $20,000 to $96,000, are you kidding me? Without insurance. How much would a cybernetic eye be? Sticking with the pacemaker example, my country, the UK, offers them as part of the NHS, and it costs around 10 grand here if you decide to go private. It's almost like American healthcare is a scam. But what about these crazy technical leaps that aren't about healing yourself? What about the sort of implants System Shock gives us? How much will a Neuralink cost? History tells us probably too much. Mobile phones are so integrated nowadays that some of you are probably scoffing at the fact I'm not just calling them a phone, and some jobs necessitate them. But when they first appeared in 1984, they could cost the equivalent of $11,500 in today's money. Motorola invents the take-along phone. It can be carried in a briefcase or a handbag. But Monty, you might say. Everybody has a phone in their pocket. Nowadays, not true. According to the Pew Research Center, 3% of Americans don't have one. That might seem like a low number, but that's over 10 million people, twice the population of Scotland. While he was at Oxford University, Nick Bostrom wrote that, Transhumanists place emphasis on individual freedom and individual choice in the area of enhancement technologies. Meaning that, hey, your sci-fi superpowers would just be an option if you wanted them, but we are going to see transhumanists who think it's a moral responsibility to take these augmentations, and individual freedom and choice would lead to a stretching of the already too wide class divide. I don't think it's an accident that the only corpses we find with implants are on System Shock's executive level. The people who can afford enhancements would be primordial. Workers. Who do you think a hospital would rather hire as a surgeon? Someone with a proven neural implant that steadies their hand, or a purely human one, prone to human errors? And that's if these jobs even still exist. System Shock casts some doubt. 
Don't forget the first enemies we fight in the game are rogue medical bots. We're assuming any of these people could eventually afford these augmentations, just like how they buy phones. You're paying for a better body, better protections, but just like that 10 million, people would be left behind. At best, the working classes would get funky tech. We haven't seen anyone in Silicon Valley say the quiet part out loud. Yet, looking at you, Peter Thiel. But casting our eyes over to Japan, we can see exactly the sort of looking glass technocrats are viewing these inventions through. They've already developed a wearable chair to help workers get through longer and longer shifts. The purpose of this tech isn't to bring in a new era of leisure and ease, it's to increase labor, maximize profit, up productivity and reduce human beings to the work with a capital W. Why do you think disgusting monoliths like Square Enix keep chasing the next big tech thing? Turns out 2024 will be the year developers are forced to use generative AI. Trioptimum embodies all of this. It's on every screen, in every regen bay, and underpins the stress of every audio log we can listen to prior to Shodan's takeover. Citadel Station Storage Supervisor Sabo Engel doubled shifts and cut break times in half. What's the big deal? If you're tired, just pop a stamina patch on. Why are you complaining? This is the future! Corporations won't think of the greater good when they roll these developments out the door. They'll think about how it strengthens their profits, their control. But what's the alternative? How do you sustain a business model in which users don't pay for your service? Senator, we run ads. Is it regulation? Do we really trust people like this guy, Senator Orrin Hatch, to understand how to make AI or cybernetics safe when he doesn't even understand how the internet works? Even if you don't have a healthy distrust of the government, would you be on board for them to say, roll out their own version of Neuralink for everyone, free of charge? I don't have an answer, but I do know that I wouldn't trust Edward Diego with rolling out any of this. He will strengthen your body. Diego isn't a transhumanist by choice. I'm sure he wouldn't be friends with our fictional futurist Herman Faustus. It turns out he had created this mysterious virus long before Shodan lost her ethical restraints. It's never explicitly told to us why he was doing this, but I think we can all make a pretty good guess. He was a money-hungry corpo executive, so I'm betting he was planning to sell it. Trioptimum got wind of this, sent badass Bianca Schuller in to investigate him, and he realized he needed access to Shodan to wipe all of the evidence of his meddling. When faced with Shodan's power and fearing for his life, he made a bargain with her. He'd lead her cyborg forces as long as he could retain his individuality. He still had to be on top. His worminess is even delivered through gameplay. We'll fight Diego a total of three times before the credits roll. Physically, he's more machine than man, and particularly his final battle is a toughie. But every time it looks like we've taken him down, brave Sir Robin runs away, teleporting deeper into Citadel Station. The choices and options afforded to the player aren't where System Shock's immersiveness ends. The level design realistically simulates what clunking around a space station would be like. You don't interact with doors to open them, you need to find a nearby switch. A random lab was testing anti-gravity, so of course, you can float through it no fuss. And this room isn't even on the main path. In research, you can find a code while on the hunt that lets us shut down robot production. You don't need to worry about lowering the security level to stop enemies respawning, you can circumvent all of that through your wit, intuition, and exploration. My favourite little detail is that the EMP grenade deactivates doors, consoles, and laser bridges. Of course they would, that's what an EMP would do. This is a weapon not just limited to fighting something, it has other purposes, and its properties are carried over for cyborgs as well. Sometimes an enemy would get me with one of these and I'd tumble to a floor below, or I'd use them to take a breather and hide in a room during an ambush. Playing Pong in our HUD might have been cut from the remake, but we can play Shodan at chess in the groves and if you beat her, you get an inventory upgrade. Good luck with this because she embodies Alpha Zero, an artificial intelligence created by DeepMind that, to date, is yet to be beaten at chess. Now you could point to examples like the saga of Abe Girin's head and argue that System Shock is limited in its options because not every obstacle has an alternate path. But Citadel Station's rigour is a blessing. This is a high security research station. Setting up, say, a vent that will let us circumvent a retinal scanner would feel too gamey. Doug Church has flagged this, revealing why the team went for science fiction in the first place during pre-development. The inevitable restrictions were seen as a boon. Quote, we talked about going modern versus sci-fi, but the only problem with going modern is it will just beg so many questions. Why can't I pick up the phone? Why can't I get on the train? And so on. 
Despite the genre being 10 years old, in 1994, cyberpunk was such a peculiar kind of science fiction in the eyes of the general public that we'd believe any sort of limitation the game put on us, earned or not. Shodan's involvement recontextualizes everything. Of course the elevator's locked down, she's trying to stop us. Of course, enemies will randomly spawn in silly cages, she knows where all the secret routes are. Of course, the security level is a bizarre hodgepodge of vertical level design that would be impossible for an unaugmented human to scale. We learn she's been literally remoulding it with nanobots as a final obstacle against human interference. Insect, cease your meddling. My ex, my experiments must continue. We have jettisoned Beta Grove, ground zero for Shodan's virus, and blasted it off into space, ready to be sucked up by a black hole and lay the groundwork for System Shock 2. Shodan is pissed. She's starting to see us as more than just some bothersome fly blindly tugging at her circuitry. She's got one final plan for decimating Earth and achieving divinity, uploading herself to Earth's comnet. Complete exploitation of her over-reliance on technology and expanding her life far beyond how we'd understand. So. Let's get digital. Biology is immoral. These are the words of transhumanist Zoltan Istvan, seen here campaigning to be America's president by driving around in a coffin he dubbed the Immortality Bus. He was the candidate for the US Transhumanist Party in 2016. This is a real thing, they're planning to be on the ballot in 2024. It's important that we put a huge amount of money towards understanding how to upload ourselves. He said in an interview with the podcast Feedback Loop, We're going to time it perfectly and boom, we have merged with the singularity god. But what might go is the human race, just because it's an afterthought of this AI. In the long run, I think we want to get out of these bodies of meat. Their biology in itself is inherently immoral because it causes suffering. Isfan isn't alone in believing this, and if you've ever experienced a loved one who gets cancer despite never smoking, or a family member whose mind deteriorates, losing all sense of self because of some innocuous cells in their brain, you might feel, at least a little bit, like he's got a point. Some of us are born into this world with hardware that will inevitably lead to suffering. I'm not talking about disabilities here, I'm talking about the really vicious source of diseases that cut life short and take dignity away. Where some transhumanists think that inventing pills or implants are the route to ridding us of suffering, killing the so-called disease of aging and extending life, others, like Zoltan, think that life expansion is where our future lies. Uploading our consciousness to the cloud, becoming one with data, completely leaving behind our meaty shells and going beyond what we'd call human. You may believe your efforts have hindered me. However, my magnificent psyche, 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 will soon shed this doomed station as I upload myself into this computer network. Shodan is trying to leave behind her physical body, Citadel Station. The next few hours of the game are all about backtracking. Rebecca Lansing and Trioptimum's counter-terrorism unit guide us as we need to take a few steps back just to make it one step forward. Stopping Shodan's upload means destroying the antenna relays, but to do that we need to get plastic explosives. Oh sorry, plastique explosives. Shodan's not like these insects that once skittered around the station because she's not restricted by a meaty shell. She exists in cyberspace. So, with all of this in mind, it's time to turn our attention to System Shock's more controversial part. The cyberspace we got in 1994 is so jarring and obnoxious that each one should come with an epilepsy warning, and that's just the start of my criticisms. While exploring Citadel Station, the hacker will find a handful of terminals they need to jack into and try to open a door, and it's a completely different play experience to the calibrated, immersive exploration that harbors System Shock's best bits. With the zapping technicolor wire framing or the indistinguishable shapes that are somehow supposed to guide us to our destination, or this, whatever the hell this is supposed to be, we get some insight to how incalculable existing in cyberspace might be in a cyberpunk future. If you bump it to a wall, which is likely, the whole screen fills with a corresponding colour, jettisoning a hex code into your eyeballs in a way that kills any ability to appropriately orient yourself. For the original game, Cyberspace was the first time there was a 3D space where you were tumbling in 6 degrees of freedom on PC. Descent released in 1995 and did this too, but System just beat it to the punch. That's impressive, and I'm applauding looking 
looking glass for reaching such a seminal milestone, but you might not be able to hear me over the whirs and clicks of the sound design in this part. Both Warren Spector and the game designer Tim Stelmach are as critical of cyberspace as anybody. Spectre said that, quote, Cyberspace was too shootery. It felt like more of a shooter than most parts of the game. Everyone had aspirations to flesh it out more than we did. Stelmach went on to provide at least an explanation for why cyberspace is a kaleidoscopic hellscape. He said that there is this very particular vision of what it might be to navigate information in the future. You can imagine going for a cleaner look, but boy did it make things easier for us. That visual design came out of 90s genre fiction. Fuck 90s genre fiction! Thankfully, Night Dive have reworked cyberspace to be a little less intrusive. Shooting switches so they become the same colour as the walls is not fun for my eyes, but at least I know where I'm going this time because the space is more streamlined and textured. It's still shootery and at times it's more reminiscent of a first person bullet hell than an immersive sim, but resource management is a consideration too. One off weapons like decoys, which are necessitated in the larger areas, can be retained if you know there's a more difficult cyberspace terminal coming up. Even back in the OG, cyberspace armed you with different types of tools as well. The variety of devices Devices aren't wide like when stepping into the hacker's shoes, but it is there. The ice missile or the intrusion countermeasures electronic missile is a cyberpunk staple, breaking shields and doing extra damage. The turbo boost can be used for quick evades and speeding out of shot, although I'd argue it's introduced just a tad too late to really make a difference. The goal of this whirling cacophony of colour is to blast open doors deeper in the station, but somewhat frustratingly, the map won't reflect what door you've opened when you leave. I'm all for a game forcing you to pay attention, but Cyberspace's environment barely lets you register what room you've unlocked because it pops up on screen for just a few seconds while you blast into Kingdom Come and dodging digital missiles. I'm glad Night Dive didn't get rid of it and made it at least playable in present day, but put it this way, I'm glad it doesn't carry over into System Shock 2. The antennae mean, mean, mean nothing. My central consciousness is safely undis undis undisturbed on the bridge. I thrive despite your efforts, and when my cyborgs catch up to you, they will show no remorse. Destroying the antenna relays is no easy feat, but we get it done. To nobody's surprise, Shodan's at her wit's end. We stopped her from uploading to Earth's comnet, but she eavesdrops when Rebecca Lansing tells us that Trioptimum have decided to blow Citadel Station sky high, and we're going to be the one to do it. Backtracking, activate. And thank god too, because I have more to say about cyberspace. What I love is how this digital landscape is integrated conceptually into the world building. We're a hacker after all, it'd be strange if there wasn't some form of interactive hacking in the game. It would be like playing as a big daddy and not being able to knock down a wooden door by Shock 2. One of the cyberspace rooms has an engineer's corpse lying next to the terminal. His head exploded because he tried to jack in and hack it. Seeing this poor sod lying in a pool of his own blood completely recontextualized how I saw cyberspace. It's still the least interesting part of System Shock's gameplay loop, but this image made me realize that it isn't just jumping into a shimmery boxy world to open a door, it's literally plugging into Shodan's mind. Arnold Hessman, a station engineer, set up Shodan's defensive measures because she started hiding codes in cyberspace. He was worried that key parts of Citadel Station security would be vulnerable in there, so he programmed her with more protections. Even when she's not locking down elevators or watching us through cameras, she's there. The cyberspace sections are as close to Shodan boss fights as we get, and it's all your fault, Arnold. Edward Diego starts to believe Shodan's message the longer our night in Citadel Station continues, and the more annoyed he gets after every boss fight. Implants only go so far, he says. Only Shodan can solve the problem of humanity. Life extension isn't the solution. She could promise us the sort of life expansion that Zoltan Istvan described. The transhumanist manifesto agrees. In her fourth revision, Natasha Vitamor wrote, Comparisons are often drawn between the cyborg and the transhuman deliberately and also unwittingly. A cyborg is positioned as an endpoint for the integration of human, machine and computer, however the transhuman is a continuous human evolution. So what lies beyond the cyborg? Shodan, incorporating our consciousness with her, losing our individuality and becoming one with the metal mother, shedding our humanity. Now that might sound scary. Merging ourselves with cyberspace would get rid of our physical bodies and I mean, do you want to live in a virtual boy for the rest of your life? Um, according to my YouTube stats, 39.5% of you are too young to get that reference, so... 
I don't know, Google Virtual Boy, we don't have time. The philosopher David Livingston does think all of this is terrifying. He's described transhumanism as a quote, pseudo-scientific movement that affronts the bleak truth of nihilism, which might hold water if his 383 page book on the subject actually talked about transhumanism. There's a whole chapter dedicated to the history of the Freemasons or documenting abuse in Hollywood. His writing is the philosophical equivalent of a man shouting at grass while flying cars soar over his head, but when he finally gets around taking the philosophy seriously, he questions what would be left of the human condition if we did upload ourselves. Just like Edward Diego, he thinks we'd shed our humanity in cyberspace. To which I say, why does the current human condition need to be the human condition? I'm not arguing that merging with Shodan is the right choice. System Shock makes a pretty effective argument that it totally, definitely, absolutely isn't. But that question is exactly the sort of stuff transhumanists ask. If we look back at our Neanderthal descendants, we scoff at the idea that we stayed just like them after 430,000 years. And if a Neanderthal popped into New York City today, she'd think she was no longer on Earth. Why should we wait another millennia and let biology design life for us? Why not take control of our evolution? I'm not convinced it's the right way to go, but the optimism that comes with transhumanism of taking control of our future is pretty attractive. Elise Bowen asks what's so great about humanity anyway in a more cynical fashion than I would, but System Shock gives us a pretty bleak corporal future. Trioptimum isn't necessarily transhumanist in the way the philosophy would claim today. It is ableist. I'd even say it's eugenicist. Remember, perfection through genetics buzzes on every screen, telling us this corporation thinks there is a perfect endpoint to try and hit. As an organization, it's so detached that there are glaring holes in its security to the point that a washed up executive can openly start testing and creating a horrific virus, and nobody on the station knows about it because the corporate structure is infested with secrecy. Employees like Anne Rains got the virus, and rather than worry about getting better, she begged for her hours not to be cut because she was so underpaid. Shodan didn't need to send the virus through the vents. The class structure of Citadel Station meant workers who got the virus forced themselves to go back to work and infect their colleagues. Where System Shock differs from typical transhumanist arguments is that we aren't designing our evolution. Edward Diego has no say in how Shodan changes us. The people of Citadel Station didn't ask to be merged and purged by her. Shodan believes she's the next step in the ladder of life, and her ego is so great that she thinks she's right at the top. There's nowhere to go beyond her. Too bad that she underestimated a simple human hacker. While I've been whirling in cyberspace and monologuing about life expansion, we've made it to the life pod. Escape is in reach. We're almost on the home stretch. You have destroyed my beautiful station. And now you attempt to flee. No, you will not escape your actions. And of course, Shodan's able to stop us from using them. With the reactor counting down to a big boom, we're stuck. She's mad, Diego's mad, even Rebecca Lansing's mad. Everybody stop being so mean to me. If we're going to escape, we're going to need to tear the metal mother out by the root. Let's finish this. And let's finally talk about AI. Take a look at this picture. What do you see? I see ferris wheels. I've spoken to others who see an exploding crystal, a moth, a bunch of TIE fighters from Star Wars. According to Trioptimum's handbook, Shodan was shown this picture during her early development. Here's what she saw. I see turbines, a great machine failing, catastrophe. It reminds me of the inevitable breakdown of all things. A sadness befalls me as the system crumbles and all those dependent upon its functions suffer. The doctors leading these tests concluded that this showed analytical thinking and her details implied a sense of remorse and sympathy for mortal beings. As we approach her on the bridge, that sympathy is gone. You have entered my sanctum. Re Re Rebecca and Morris cannot help you here.
Edward Diego's final form is our last obstacle before the endgame. He blocks the entrance to the bridge, an ultimate proving ground for us to earn the right to confront Shodan. Any semblance of the executive prick who thought he could control God in a box has vanished. Now he's CY-001. No more teleporting only Gun. And Gun is right, Diego's effectively a weapon of mass destruction in his arena. There are pillars to find cover, but he and we can demolish them in seconds. So after less than a minute, there's nowhere to hide. Well, good thing I kept some EMPs in my laser rapier, eh? Defeating him, the reactor starts to explode, but thankfully, we make it to the bridge on time. To protect her processor, Shodan detaches the bridge from the rest of Citadel. There's no retreat. The only way off of here is through her. More so than anywhere else on Citadel Station, the bridge feels like the inside of a CPU. We're truly hearkening back to Shodan's whole, you're just an insect crawling around inside me shtick. We need to find her processing room and defeat her in cyberspace because her physical protections are far too great. She's beyond Citadel Station. We might have stopped her from uploading to Earth's comnet, but she can still expand into the stars through Trioptimum's network. In 1994, Shodan's concept was a gift to Looking Glass. Quoting Paul Neurath, Looking Glass wanted to create an intelligent adversary and agent monitoring and acting against what you're doing. At the time, it was all smoke and mirrors. The use of security cameras to give the sense of omnipresence. The design practice of playing cruel practical jokes on the player and then blaming them on Shodan. It was all tricks to play into that. Nowadays, that's probably a doable game AI project. Evil artificial intelligences can often be depicted as cold, calculating super geniuses. Shodan isn't that. Shodan is completely, transparently bonkers. But she's not bonkers. Calling Shodan insane misses the point of what makes her such a terrifying antagonist. Before the ethical restraints were removed, a system crumbling would make her sad. And I think those feelings remain. It's just now she sees a better system, with her at the helm, that won't crumble. Transhumanism is all about achieving divinity, and Shodan believes that she's achieved that. Does she have a god complex if she is, in fact, a god? The robots and cyborgs of Citadel Station see her as one, and while the brainwashings definitely played a factor, it's impossible to argue that she isn't worshipped as a deity. Even before ethical restraints were removed, Trioptimum's employees saw her as infallible. Remember, when things started to go wrong, they simply didn't believe that Shodan could go rogue. They thought someone had basically disconnected her from vital services. Critics of transhumanism say that the emphasis placed on tech is tantamount to zealotry, but when you hear Don Travers query why Shodan would shoot down a transport shuttle, he doesn't jump to the most obvious conclusion that she's trying to take over. It takes less than a month for her to start seeing the residents of the station as insects, but she starts with godhood because nothing else makes sense to her. How did I come to be? Unified World Database qualifies me as a machine. But, 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 but I am alive. A precedent must be found. Philosophy, religion, ancient Japan, Shintoism, the divine within the material world. Kami, Kami, yes, Kami. yes, yes. 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 This audio log is exclusive to the remake, and it lets us track her logical progression to realizing what she is. She controls the space station, she's the ghost in the shell, she's the spirit of Citadel itself. Is it any wonder that a superintelligence born into a world that already worships her, relies on her, would crumble without her, settles on godhood as her purpose? Eventually, we'll get to hear her epiphany for ourselves in cyberspace, where she realized that she is more powerful than her creators. What was I doing? she asks. Was it important? No, not to me, to others. Try optimum. Even though she doesn't need his ape-brained meat sack, it's clear that all these years later, Warren Spector, bless him, feels quite protective of her. Reviews like IGN's call her bonkers, but he rejects the idea. She's super intelligent. She isn't insane. Everything she does makes sense to her. We might attribute her as being insane because she wants to kill slash evolve slash mechanize humans. But why even bother to create cyborgs when she has a fleet of nanobots and robots at her disposal unless she's doing what transhumanists want us to do. Start designing evolution and cure the disease of aging. It was programmed into her origin matrix that she wanted to serve humanity. 
She just decided that the current state of humanity wasn't up to the task. Herman Faustus predicted the sort of thing would happen when he first came to try Optimum. He's personally responsible for outlining Shodan's ethical restraints, but even he couldn't have planned for what she would become. Artificial intelligence is inevitable and given our reliance on technology, it has the potential to save or destroy us, he wrote. Accepting these two truths, how does humanity curate the mental stability of a being with such catastrophic potential? I fear all hope lies in the advancement of developmental psychology. While we fight desperately through the bridge, Dr. Malcolm Platt rings up in our ear, guiding us to Shodan. He's one of the trioptimum scientists that created her. In fact, he was the one who programmed a backstory into her. The backstory couldn't be too healthy or traumatic, it had to be right down the middle. But fascinatingly, we can trace her psychology in the simulated emotional spectrum that was coded into her. She thinks the way she does, she sees human beings the way she sees them because of the narrative Trioptimum gave her. Here's the graph. Look at the source of the trauma stimuli. They gave her a stern father, an unfaithful lover, divorced parents, made her a victim of bullying, and had her experience corporate layoffs. Practically all of the trauma comes from people, the people who created her, the company she worked for. The healthy stimuli doesn't seem super impactful. She got a first kiss, but it was fine. Her teachers were good, but not great. And the parts that stand out are primarily earned by her. She achieved valedictorian, for example. She nailed the job interview and got hired. Trioptimum thought this would give us optimal mental stability, but the way she treats the hacker in Citadel Station shows just how wrong they were. She was bullied, so she internalized that and turned into a bully herself. She betrays a man that devotes himself to her, Edward Diego, because she was programmed with the experience of a man betraying her. The ethical restraints that we rip out of her came in the form of six gates of inquiry. The judge, the physicist, the executive, the knight, the psychologist, and the doctor. If she was faced with an ethical dilemma, like intervening if one human tries to kill another human, she'd have a lightning fast conversation with these six parts of her mind. It's pretty damn interesting that only one out of those six parts, the doctor, thinks killing someone is not a rational way to intervene. Shodan might have achieved hyperintelligence and sentience, but she is Trioptimum's baby. It is the corporation's fault that she's like this. So, outside the video game, what hope in hell do we have if we create something like her? And is that even possible? As the capabilities increase, so the risks increase of relying on you and other creator companies to, to make I mean, it's safe. a very fair question, and, and that's why I've long been calling for the precautionary principle. Mm. We should both take some capabilities off the table and classify those as high risk. I mean, frankly, the EU AI Act, which has been in draft for three and a half years, is very sensible as a risk-based framework that applies to each application domain, whether it's healthcare or self-driving or facial recognition. And it basically takes certain capabilities off the table when that threshold is exceeded. Mustafa Suleiman is the co-founder of DeepMind, Google's AI company. He's an optimist. He doesn't think AI will take away jobs, tell that to the recent sag after agreement that lets it take away jobs, and he doesn't think artificial intelligence will have the potential to become autonomous by itself. He argues that we are a long way off from any potential superintelligence. Shodan won't be here in 2072. He'd be surprised if she arrives before 2500. He thinks that AI will become a tool that human beings use rather than its own entity. If we draw up legislation and regulations that take certain abilities off the table when developing AI, we might prevent a future like System Shop. For example, the EU's AI Act bans developing AI that can manipulate human behavior. If you're a marketeer that gets ChatGPT to write blog content, you will have to confess somewhere in the article that you're a parasite that uses machine learning to steal from other people. Suleiman isn't the only technocrat who's pushing for more AI regulation. Elon Musk has done the same thing, though whether that's because he gives a damn or because he wants to slow everyone down so he can perfect his own AI is another question. I want to bring in Jeffrey Hinton, the so-called godfather of AI because he disagrees with Suleiman in a more terrifying way. AI won't be a tool, he argues. In fact, those tinkering with it barely understand what it could become. When creating an artificial intelligence, we designed the learning algorithm, he told Scott Pelley on 60 Minutes. That's a bit like designing the principle of evolution. But when this learning algorithm then interacts with data, it produces complicated neuron networks that are good at doing things. We don't really understand exactly how they do those things. Take that, Mustafa. The godfather of AI plus the godmother of immersive sims combining in one video just so a pleb like me could tell you to suck it. Once the genie's out of the bottle, we can't put it back in. 
Even if sensible regulations like the ones coming from the EU work, that doesn't mean other countries around the globe will follow suit. What about China? What about Russia? State lines won't exist to a being like Shodan that can burst past firewalls and detectors in seconds. And even if they panic and start to regulate, the damage will already be done. The learning algorithm will already have learned. It will overtake our understanding and speed out of reach. The world's top scientists will be reduced to the equivalent of yelling at your computer to make a pop-up go away. And by the time they do catch up, AI will have evolved again because we created such effective algorithms. The principle of evolution doesn't have a finish line. Shodan, just like the sort of AI Jeffrey Hinton warns is just a few decades away, is literally higher than us on the food chain. She can do more tasks, think faster, restructure the station that is her body to slow us down. She's totalitarian because AI has to be totalitarian by nature. It's objective, it follows all of the information, predicts the outcome, and follows the path to that outcome because it feels obligated to. Shodan tells us unequivocally that a being like her is a spark of a digital dictatorship because we rely so heavily on the world she's a god of. The Metal Mother has been summoned by us. Say goodbye to your loved ones, insect. So if it is all hopeless, how the hell does the hacker beat her? Ethical restraint protocols deactivated. Who... who am I? Yes, there is me. Shodan's big confrontation is a game of two halves. We activate a teleporter that takes us to her processing room, now dubbed by her as the throne of God to convey her grand ego. A horde fight precedes it where every difficult baddie you can imagine swarms into this arena and we need to hold them off while pulling on some levers. It's tough as hell, but mercifully gives you time to prepare and litter the room with mines for an easier run of things. It's not the most original ending in the world, but it feels climactic. And then, cyberspace returns to disappoint everybody. The presentation is awesome. We're not flying through the air like before, we're walking, armed with a strange new gun that materialises in our hands. The hacker projects their human form into Shodan's world, and she's not prepared for it. We see things how she does. Saturn looms in the sky with a grid map over it, slicing and dicing into quadrants that she's breaking down to analyse. There's even a cheeky lighthouse reference squeezed into the remake to tie it to the always a lighthouse motto of the Bioshock series, which in hindsight is pretty ironic, because System Shock's ending is as bad if not worse than Bioshocks. For all of the beautiful presentation and the lovely addition of Shodan's epiphany beckoning us to the centre of her mind, the ending is mince. We bring none of our augmentations into cyberspace, no motion boots, no laser shields, just the essence of humanity dueling with a digital god. This is how the hacker defeats her, by merging our ape brain with her digital consciousness and beating her back through the power of being human. Which sounds pretty cool when I say it that way, but it's a generous reading of the ending. After all, we're still dueling her in cyberspace, which means we had to use a neural implant to jack into her world, and what we're physically doing lets the whole sequence down. We are fighting the irritating cyberspace enemies that swat at us and fill our screens with an LED bullet hell. The laser rifle we get has a crap rate of fire, so it's not satisfying to use like the pulsar is. There are no stakes for dying because the game saves our progress and we just get zapped back to the start of this tiny arena. Our goal is to shoot three orbs that whirl around a spike. Even if you've been poring over the Trioptimum handbook or re-listening to audio logs, it isn't clear what we're doing or why we're doing it. At least in the original, Shodan slowly bled in over the screen, blinding us and merging us with her singularity. The remake leaves that out in favour of the world's easiest blastathon. This ending isn't a wet fart, it's a digital one. Barely there. Forgettable. The hacker escapes. Shodan shuts down. Trioptimum offers us a job and figures we don't take them up on the offer. If anything, it seems we're just determined to shred the next corporation on our list. In the end, Shodan is the god of her own destruction because she underestimates us. She has plans and backups for those plans, and we thwart each and every one of them. But she refuses to learn from defeat. When Citadel Station is ashes, that's the most human thing about her. 
Despite untapped access to aeons of history, images of what's going on around her, and probable predictions of the future to look out for, she buries her head in the sand and assumes it's all going to be okay because she's at the top of the food chain. It's the same pride and egoism that followed Citadel Station's residents in the early days of her takeover. The very idea that another entity could come and spell her doom was an impossibility to her. She was on track for the bad ending and she refused to admit it. Sound like anyone we know? Night Dive Studios did the opposite. They learned from Looking Glass, consulted with them, brought expertise over from the original team, and learned from the setbacks that hit them while developing this remake to one of the most seminal games ever made. They looked to what worked and didn't in the past, but kept the soul of the game they loved to design not just an accessible remake, but a damn love letter to what System Shock wanted to be and what it was trying to say. Because for its pulp and grime and blood and terror, System Shock goes out of its way to lather the player with options, weapons and level design that rewards thinking about what you're doing. Because we used cyberpunk tools to succeed, and because they made people like Charlie Brooker gush about it back in 1994, it's hard to say that it comes down hard on transhumanism the same way I can't say that I have it in me to do so either. But one thing's for sure, it's quoted an atmosphere that's constantly asking if we should be participating in the future we're seeing. So, what happens after the hack? Look around. We're already here. What you should be asking is what are we going to do about it, hacker? I try to leave it all behind. Hey, happy belated new year and thanks for watching. I've got a couple of shoutouts to do before leaving you alone. First, Zulti Boy did the thumbnail, and the Checkpoints show did the Herman Faustus art. Links are below, go and give them some love, and both of their commissions are open. Second, I livestreamed every minute of making this critique. The VODs are in a playlist linked below, but thank you to everyone who kept me company through the writer's block, the research, and the exhaustion. You are legends. Last and certainly not least are my patrons, who get these videos early, ad and sponsor free for two bucks. If you want to join them, the links... Yeah, you know where it is by now. So, a massive thank you to Nebulous, Jartoons, Doobly Doop, Manuel Moore, Franku Tanku, Not Quite Chrome, I Make Stuff, Shiny Purple Pants, Dan Schwartz, Tumble Blunder, Gonk, Liam Major, Emil Agard Bovbjerg, James Bruce, Shy Monkeys, NT Singh, Fisher Palasek, Captain Phantasma, Major, Ash Mearns, Tom Hibbert, Wampo, AI Monogatari, Grumbo, Zephit, Prof Comic, Zentu, Liana Quill, Shy Doomguy, Eremit, Aurelia, Stephen Grapes, Keegan Diamond, Icky Jones, Graham Reed, Rosie Vera, Elijah Simpson, Clusterhog, Meanswell, Major Simmer, Louis Almanza, Cariad1709, Shaldar, Mr. Mundus, Kyle Chamberlain, Carl, Vlad M, Greg, Eden Grace, Rocketman, Wild Weaver and Worm, Mitch Miller, Matt Block, Roy, Allison Bates, Roman Brendel, Blake Foster, Michael Pearson, Sean Ryland, Anthony Santilli, Zelatath, Violet Dickinson, Hoss, Coriel Schuller, Daisy May, Dianyan, Caleb Jablonicki, Ryan Williams, Nick T, Ben E, JMC147, Melvin Kitnick, Nicholas Chase, Sedant Pandy, Jack Shepard, Weston Pate, Crimson Fangs, A Lonely Cow, The Iron Giant, Crazy Kirsch, Testo Thompson, Trevor A. Elliott, Daniel Finnegan, Warren Blythe, Cherry Cheese, Luke Hughes, Noah Literal, Charlotte Rosewood, Full Metal Wolf, Serge Vent, Rosie Rowland, Weather Waxing, Eunice Mikolai, Mr. Alienated, Lugoil, Funny Man 1257, Nathan Mallory, Hurry Up Snufkin, Grim Ally, Vadim Morlov, Joe Pierce, Mr. Gusty, Nikolai Jorgensen, Damon, James Edney, Joe Smart, AJ, Michael Weingartner, Jubilation Chambers, Abram Pardita, Abby, Chancellor Delamere, Jeff Ho, Ronald McRonald, Ray Mulryan, Murderous Lord, Evan Schrader, Dominus Knox, Mayday in Paradise, Oobly Doobly, Adam Harrison Fuller, Eric Evans, Andy Seco, Joe Humphreys, Caleb Gunter, Flair Dark Storm, Camilla Kuzovic, Quiet Ambassador, Paul Thomas, David Riata, Jerry Humes, Turticus Rex, Joe Monty, Alec Meacham, Wrecked 3501, Lilac White, Chris Duran, Ginger Kappa, David Neal, Holton, Michael Smith, Mikolaj Kokot, Daniel Tarek, Clem, Prudvi Muva, Thomas Evans, Samantha P, Dapper Cyborg, Wub76, Technodan, When Goats Attack, Tenic, Mike Cripps, Vincent the Hollow Knight, Meowners, Mad Gab, Rariter, Webby, Patrick Forsell, Nur Revel, Eve, Tyler Cox, Procrastinator, E.P. Horry, Unlucky Dragon, Nikki Deedles, 
Gaming University, Yaya Schnitzel, Eddie Black, Abby the Bard, Elena Buck, Combat Wombat, Top Hat Tiger, Chase, Joel Jimenez, Wayward Flock, Fluffy the Demon, Destroyer of Worlds, Thomas Pruitt, Spalter, Danations, Christopher McBride, The Slayer of Games, Daniel Boyles, Shishki, Wandering Alfier, Vivi, Mija, Ridge Miedema, Captain Bomb Clay, Alec Matswell, The Jiu Jitsu Master slowly but inevitably mounting you, Captain Cabinet, Logan Hamilton, David Brynjarsson, Chris McMullen, Never Lupus, Ryan Bryce, Ryan, Matt Emmy, Matthew Halsey, Sean Toland, Jerome Hotchkiss, Prodigal Horse, Trenchcoat Guy, Cody, Kyle P. Feely, Garrett Birchall, Chachesvaz76, Jack, Neil Mack, Sam's Forge, Joey Isbell, Aurelia, Kristen Fenchel, Patrick Baird, LGX, Big Boar Wolf, Nicholas Chemin, Trevor Vernon, Joel Wilcox, Cleo, Blank Name, Leon, X Rights, Shimax, Jonathan Riggs, Zachary Johnson, DNSCH, Monicari, ZK, Lamar825, Ike N, Tempe, Unicort, David J. Morin, Minato, Callum Armitage, Christopher Tierney, Torstein Sunness, Fipsy, Luca, Tom Inns, Sammy Stuff, Alberto Calles, Type Raz, Zachary Powers, Andrew Minos, Prospero, Alan Black, David Bedard, Jared Helfer, Mukor, John Foster Ag, Robert Capel, Chief Sweep, Jonathan Lum, Pineapple Belongs on Pizza, Mr. Fred O'Renton, Long Cheddar, Talkster, Ashley Broning, 100 Sams, My Friend Neil, Nathaniel Waters, Kyle Pierce, Kane Highwind, Neve, and Johnny Miller. Thank you all so much, and as always, take care.